Well, away we go <laughs> with Brian Driscoll. What a day. <laughs> hey. <laughs> what a day. Day in the life, That's right? right? Day in the life. Goodness gracious. What are you going to do? <laughs> you're you're going to be on the phone all day. This is one of those days, Sean, where you just kind of say, oh, I'm so glad I had unlimited text and talk. <laughs> like, <laughs> okay. Catch so your some, breath. So some news today, Sean, huh? Yes. A little <laughs> bit. A little bit of big news. Jack Swarbrick stepping down as athletic director. Notre, Notre Dame, of course, made the announcement this morning. I was in the middle of doing something else, like we always are when this kind of stuff happens mm -hmm. I, I got a text that didn't really spell anything out of course i go to twitter and and there it is so swarbrick's gonna step down they've got a a, a succession plan in place notre dame alum and current N nbc sports chairman peter bavacqua is going to take the helm in the meantime for the next year beginning this july 1st bavacqua is going to essentially work as swarbrick's understudy he's going to be the special assistant to the president for athletics. Uh, so it's it's uh, it's big news. I, I know that this is going to hit on different sides. Some people oh, yeah. are going to love it. Some people are going to hate it. Other people, because of you know what you're going to read into this, you know, are going to have some uh, trepidation. Sure. I guess we'll just sure. start with you and and what you think of this, Brian. Well, you know, it's interesting, Sean. I had a lunch on campus about a year ago with a, a guy who's a, a pretty big donor at Notre Dame. And this was a name that was kind of floated to me about a possible replacement for Jack Swarbrick uh, about that time. And uh, former head of the PGA as well. And that was one of the things that was, was kind of discussed was obviously he's run a, uh, he, the concern is if it was only in the media side, it's like, well, does that really prepare you for doing this job? But you know, he's run the PGA and, you know, Notre Dame is more like a big business like that than it is, like Duke or Vanderbilt, or I mean, it's just a different animal being the athletic mm -hmm. director at Notre Dame. So this isn't an expect an unexpected move, Sean, from the standpoint of Jack Swarbrick being gone. I mean, how many years have you and I been hearing that, that oh, well, this is his last year, this is his Take last year? And, and I honestly believe, yep. yeah, if not for COVID, I honestly think he would have retired already. I really do. I just feel like when that all went down and the challenges that, that arose, there was always something that it was like, well, I need to see this through. I think the timing of this makes a ton of sense. You, I, my understanding, this is, this is not, I'm not telling you facts. I'm just telling you what I've been told by people who would have a better idea than, than us, that the, the expectation is the TV deal and the apparel deal will likely be done before this transition is finalized. Now, obviously Pete's going to be part of that process now. Right. Since he is he is now going to at least as of now in uh, July 1st, will be employed by Notre Dame. I, do, I don't believe either is done right now. But the understanding is, is that Jack is going to have a still have a big role in finalizing those deals. And now you've got the new guy coming in as Which, well with that. And I think that's important because like you look at where Jim Phillips is out there in the ACC and everybody talks about this bad TV deal that the ACC got. Jim Phillips inherited that out there and he's been left to deal with it. So right. uh, I think it's, I think it's very good that, that Pete Pavacqua can be part of this, part of the negotiations with, with these deals getting right. done and not just be left with someone else's contract, you know, wh whatever it happens to be. Right. Cause he's going to inherit a lot of brand new coaches. Mm -hmm. I mean, that that's the right. He, he's not going to be making a football change most likely anytime soon, a women's basketball change, a men's basketball change. Hopefully none of those three things are happening anytime soon. So the three new hires, and we'll get into all that later, are, are kind of there. It's going to be basically, what are you going to do with these money deals? What are you going to do with uh, – and these are areas where I'm actually confident that this is going to get done. This is a guy that was the head of you know NBC Sports, Sean. I mean, uh, NBC Sports Group. So I, I know you've got some feelings on that that we'll get into here in a little bit. But that's all part – I'm like, I'm, okay, those deals will be good. I mean, he, this guy knows the business as long as he's not a complete you know boob. Uh, he's going to be able to come in and, and and know how to get those and know the value. He's a Notre Dame alum, obviously played as a walk-on under Lou Holtz, so he, he's familiar with the, the Notre Dame football tradition. The other side of that, though, is my concern, the flip side of it is, with the money stuff and and all those type of things, I feel real confident that, uh, that, that he's going to thrive there because that's what we know he can do. He can work those deals. You don't get the head of the PGA – you don't get to be the head of NBC Sports Group if you don't know how to make 
deals that are going to benefit you and your client. The, but there's a lot of other things that are facing Notre Dame and college football, college athletics that I don't know how he's going to handle those. NIL, the legislature, uh, em, em, being employees and all those type of things mm -hmm. and, and, and players being, you know, I don't know where he's going to stand on those. I don't know what background he has on those. So those are always some of the unknowns and Jack Swarbrick, you know, conference realignment, those type of things. Um, it, the NCAA is going to live or die, all those kind of things. And we kind of know where Jack Swarbrick stood on those. I don't know his experience with those things or his belief on those things or whatever that case may be. So that part's the unknown. The business side looks like it's going to be smooth. This other side uh, is the one that's a little bit more of a, of a question mark. Not that he's not going to do a good job. It's just how the heck can I know? Because he has no experience working in that in that universe, right? He, uh, you look at his background. He's a very sharp guy. He's never worked directly in college athletics. You know, the the closest thing is just this relationship with Notre Dame, being the chair of NBC Sports. But like you said, you know, he's he's worked with you know he's worked in golf. He's worked with the PGA. He, he got a law degree, but he graduated from Notre Dame in '93 and then got a law degree from Georgetown four years later and he's really kind of skyrocketed up the charts he was in you know like the, the the 40 under 40 list you know a few years back you know when he was a little bit younger he is a 93 Notre Dame alum so he's north of 40 now like a lot of us but you know just he's I think one of the the big things as you look back over his resume is he has as you said the business side he has experience on both sides of these TV deals. Like when you look at the upcoming TV deal, as an example, both were, you know, signing rights deals when he was with the PGA and also, of course, signing rights deals in the four years since he's been with NBC between the NFL and, you know, other, you know, the Big Ten uh, deal being the biggest recent one, that Big Ten contract bringing Big Ten football you know, primetime football to NBC and all that kind of stuff. So he's worked on on both sides of this over the course of his career. And that's the interesting part, right? Isn't that, I mean, that ultimately what drives a lot of this success, Sean, is are you able to negotiate those deals that are going to benefit your your institution? Right. Those are things that, that like, okay, with him and Jack Swarbrick now both involved in this, it's going to, it's, you know, you feel good that Notre Dame's going to get some big deals. I had a I had somebody reach out to me yesterday who's um, sort of a big wig at Notre Dame. Somebody that that uh, was one of the people that that got me the news that Marcus Freeman deal was done. You know, which allowed us to break that Irish breakdown broke that on our board. Uh, th that news, and he's one of those guys that's kind of always been on top of hey, this is what's going on because he has access to that. And one of the things he told me, I mean, he I, I can't throw numbers out. He asked me not to throw numbers out, Sean. But the thing he told me is 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 the 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 range that they're now talking about with the TV deal that the negotiations are now centered around just looking at the Notre Dame money, you're going to talk about a double to potentially close to tripling what their current TV revenue is. If this is the kind of hire that maybe helps take them over the finish line, you're adding a, a guy that, that, that knows how to, how to get these big deals done. You know, I mean, look, let's be real. If you're, if you're part of the PGA, if you're the head of the PGA tour, if you're part of the NBC sports group, you're negotiating much bigger deals than what Notre Dame's going to get. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because you're working with the whole Big Ten conference and you're working with the whole PGA and those type of things. So this is a guy that that has experience doing that. Now you have another, let's just say, heavyweight in this conversation, Sean. You, you now say, okay, those numbers that I was given yesterday, and this doesn't even include the ACC money. And I gave you the range, you know, off, off air. Those are going to be some big moves if he's able to – kind of help finalize that kind of deal. And that's just the TV deal. We're not even talking about what the apparel deal is going to be because the apparel deal is probably going to, I mean, it's going to have to happen before the TV deal because the apparel deal expires before the TV. Right. Actually, it's technically kind of the, the negotiation window has already expired Yeah, for that, where the TV deal has a little bit more uh, of, of a little bit longer life on it. So that part of it, Sean, it's hard to complain about that. It's, it's the other side. Can he, does he know how to run an athletic department? You know, what's his hiring and firing process going to be like? What's his what's his relationship going to be like with conference commissioners? What's his relationship going to be like with the college football playoff committee, with all the different 
you know, the organizations that Jack Swarbrick's been a, 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 a mover and shaker in, you know, and, and when we talk about uh, the college football playoff expansion, it was a couple ADs and, and another guy. And then Jack Swarbrick, you know, is, is, is Pete Bavacqua going to be part of that? Is he going to have carry that same weight? Those are all questions that I think are fair to ask. It's not, I don't, I won't assume the negative or the wrong. It's just, those are the, those are going to be the things that are ultimately going to determine the long-term success of this hire. I think the immediate success, Sean, is going to be with these, when these deals come out, we're going to like, Hey, I think people are going to be happy with the numbers that, that Notre Dame is going to get on those two deals. He's going to be the guy that's taken over in that, that sort of that universe. So I think the start is going to be strong. The question is going to be, can he handle the other side, the non- revenue side of running the Notre Dame athletic department, which let's be honest, Sean is a completely different animal than any other AD job in, in America. Let, let's yeah. be, let's be real about that. You're right. It's, it's one thing to crunch numbers and, and, you know, deal in kind you know, again, he's a lawyer. So to be able to deal in contracts and the details of these contracts, but now there's obviously much more interpersonal relationships that come into play when you're talking about, all the different coaches that you are you're the boss of i do find it interesting that just a few weeks ago and i, I we touched on this briefly on uh, on ib nation sports talk when marcus freeman and a bunch of his assistants went to the kentucky derby with their wives they were the guest of pete bavacqua down there and he was you know nbc obviously televising the Kentucky Derby, but they were his guests down there. So it it sounds like he spent a lot of time with the most important, <laughs> not to take away any importance from any other coach, but, you know, being completely honest, he spent some time with the most important coach at Notre Dame before he became his boss and, and with a lot of guys on that staff as well. So I think that that's at least, you know, was, was maybe sort of uh a glimmer of the importance that he saw in that, you know, maybe being able to spend some time with those guys down there at an event like that. You're muted right now. I didn't want to have everybody hear me uh, stir, <laughs> uh, stirring tea, honey into my tea. Uh, Cause my throat is pretty much shot. As you know, Sean, I went to bed about five 30 last night and <sighs> woke up around nine, nine 30 to this. And so I've been on the phone literally being since until the moment I quickly hopped in the shower before, before the show. So I'm trying to make sure that I can salvage my voice a little bit, but so I, I apologize. But, as, you know, I said earlier, Sean, that one of the things is, is, is I was told, like I said, this was a name that was mentioned to me over a year ago. This is not something that just happened within the last three days. Another thing that I was told today is this wasn't even originally going to get released today. It's going to happen somewhat soon, but it started to get released today because there were start, people were starting to, starting to kind of get out a little bit. And so Notre Dame had to speed up the process a little bit of, of making the announcement. And so uh, that's another aspect of it. But this, this has been something that's been in the works for a while. This wasn't decided like a, two weeks ago. You know, like I guarantee when he met with Marcus Freeman, this was the direction they were going to go. And, um, you know, I, I think, and you know, again, this is a, a Notre Dame alum that played football at Notre Dame. I think he was a punter. He was a walk-on mm -hmm. punter. Walk-on punter, yeah. Right. So, I mean, so so you, you'd, you'd hope, you'd hope, that he's someone who's going to come in with an, uh, an understanding of, of what the football team means to the university and the community. You'd I think mean, he's, know that. Yeah. I mean, he was here during the Lou Holtz era. And during the, you, during the great period the, of the Lou the, Holtz era. Yes, right. the great Lou Holtz right after the national championship and up until, you know, a team that, that I think as you detailed on Twitter – very easily could have won another championship yes. if not playing for Miami. And then, of course, the 93 team that lost to Florida State that could have won a championship. He was a walk-on punter on that team. So, I mean, he's I, – I, I don't think that, that the importance of independence and things like that, you know, all these different things are going to be lost on a guy like Peter Bovacqua. I wanted to go back real quick to what you were saying about the uh, the news starting to get out. I talked to Neil Ivy this morning, and we're actually we recorded an interview. It's going to be on mm -hmm. Ivy Nation Sports Talk tonight. But we were originally supposed to record it at 11 a.m. We had to push it. I got a text. We 
that we had to push it back a couple of hours. It was because of this announcement. And she woke up this morning and the other coaches woke up this morning knowing nothing about this announcement coming. They got over there and this is what they found out. You know, they right. all the all the coaches were summoned, summoned to uh to this space when when they were told about what was going on. So you're right. Like it when you know you you know how it is, especially at a place like that, when news does start to seep out, really the only way to control it is to kind of do what just, you just said. Let's yeah, go come ahead out and get it, it out there. Right. Yeah, that's right. None of these right. none of the coaches knew what was going to happen this morning before this right. announcement was made. My my thought is that I believe that he knew that this decision was going to be happening when oh, he sure. met with the Notre Dame coaches for the Kentucky Derby is is where I'm coming. I think he knew that this sure. was going yeah. to be the case. Yeah. And he knew this job was eventually going to happen. And I, I'll be honest, I'm <laughs> this is going to sound really petty, Sean. But one of the things that I have been was told over a year ago when his name was brought up, that there were some, including like Jack Swarbrick, there were some rumblings that he might want Ron Paulus to be his successor, things like that. This was my first thought is, okay, it's not Ron Paulus. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> I mean, based on based on – the boards, I think a lot of people have that same thought. <laughs> yeah. You're not alone. Like, okay, I don't know anything about this guy, but it's not Ron Paulus. So that's that's a success. So I mean, look, there's there's no way you can look at this higher. And if you're being objective about it, say it's a bad hire. There's no way you can look at this higher and say, Oh my gosh, he's gonna do great at Notre Dame. We we don't know, right? We don't know. You can just look at the resume and say, you know, how how does his resume compare to that of Jack Swarbrick, for example? You know, what what did Jack Swarbrick do before he came to Notre Dame? You know, I mean, so he he was a lawyer. You know, he was involved with what you may, may not want this to be discussed, but you know, was involved with the the U.S. Uh, women's gymnastics, gymnastics, yeah. and and things along those lines. And so, um, it's it's not a it's it's he actually comes to this job with a little bit more. Oh, how do I say this? Um, a little bit more. I mean, really no different experience, maybe even a little bit more experience dealing in this world than what Jack Swarbrick had. You know, I think Jack Swarbrick was was doing what before he came to Notre Dame? He worked with, um, you know, the Indiana Sports Corp, uh, mm-hmm. which, again, were all big picture things where this is a situation where this guy is making deals uh, to get to – get now, Jack was a finalist for the NCAA uh, job that Miles Brand eventually got. So it's not like he didn't have any experience with college athletics, but this guy's been in part of the things that are now moving college athletics, which is negotiating TV deals. Right. So at least he has that. And, and the biggest, and I think Jack the biggest did, question, yeah. like Jack Swarbrick had really the biggest question that we're talking about with. Exactly. With Bavakwa. Exactly. Right? And that's my point. Yeah. Right. He right. had no experience running a, uh, department. He had no dis- experience running an athletic department, but again, mm-hmm. the uh, being an AD at Notre Dame isn't a typical AD job. It's not about setting schedules. That's honestly something that you are kind of putting in somebody else in charge of. You know, where ADs and other schools are doing that. Your big job is you are you are negotiating hundreds of millions of dollars, billions billion dollar deals. I mean, that that's the stuff that you're doing. You're you're pushing for the fundraising for the Crossroads project and building the new indoor facility and negotiating, you know, conference expansion and the and the college football playoff expansion and and all those big deals and those type of things, you're not the person running some of the day to day. And so what's going to be very important and where I believe in recent years Jack Swarbrick at times has faltered or fallen short is I think some of those hires have not been good enough. Ron Paulus being an example. So a big key for this job, un, even more so than any other AD job that I know of, Sean, is you're going to have to make sure that your associate ADs are very competent people because they're the ones doing a lot of the day-to-day stuff in the athletic department. Right. And that's a big part of this job, too. We I don't know what kind of hiring experience. I mean, he obviously has hiring experience, but like six track record is the word I'm looking, the phrase I'm looking for here. I don't know what his hiring track record is. But that's going to be an important piece of this too. Is is, it, is there going to be a shakeup in the athletic department? There are some people that flat out just need to go, if we're being honest in the athletic department at the, the higher up level. Is he going to come in and shake some of that stuff up, or is it just going to you know do what Jack did when Jack first got here, which is okay, I'm going to let all these coaches go a year, evaluate everything, see where everything right. is, and then start making decisions. So it's going to be very interesting to see how he does those type of things, 
And and again, those are unknowns, but those are th- those are the things that are going to also be part of how he's ultimately going to be judged and evaluated. I know some alums that are are happy about this. Obviously, Brady Quinn had a lot of good things to say about this. And uh, you know, I, I, everything I've heard about this guy so far, Sean, has been great. It sounds sounds wonderful, but it's just it, this is a different animal, man. I don't know that you can ever truly be prepared for this particular job. Uh, and um, even if you've been an AD somewhere. I don't know if that necessarily prepares you for for because the AD at Notre Dame basically does the job of the conference commissioners mm-hmm. more so than the job of what yeah. the Duke AD is doing. Or he was at the negotiating table, right? Right, figuring out the college football playoff expansion, right? Right, yeah. with the other commissioners, not the AD it, at Alabama. With conference commissioners, yeah, right. not, not right. school. He's sitting down with Greg yeah. Sankey, not whoever the AD at Alabama is, right? I mean, right. that's the difference of of being the AD at Notre Dame compared to being the AD at other schools. So um, he's the business experience to certainly help and, and give people some – some. Uh, I mean, because to me, Sean, that's such an important – I mean, it, it sucks to be able to say that's the biggest thing, but it really is. Well, but I mean, it, it the, really is. The, the benefit that he will have that Jack Swarbrick didn't is this year on the job working with Jack Swarbrick yeah. and getting, you know, getting familiar with all these, you know, like you said, Jack Swarbrick's first year on the job, he kind of sat back, let every, you know, all the coaches do their stuff and then started to make some evaluations and then some changes where Bavakwa is going to be on the job and he'll get to, you know, he'll kind of get to embed himself to whatever yeah. extent he wants with a lot of these. He's going to get to go through at least a full football season and most likely yeah. basketball season. Cause what we heard is Jack's going to step aside sometime in like the first quarter or so first half of the year of 2024. There has been no date given yet of the specific date of departure. So clearly it's going to be one of those things that'll just be, you know, let's see how things are going in this process. And, and so you're right. That's a great point, Sean. He will have time to kind of sit back and evaluate, talk to people, get the lay of the land before he has to start making decisions. And he's not, he also, the, the, because sometimes you may say, well, like, is this really the right way to go about it? You know, you're going to sit here and be an understudy. I think absolutely when you consider what's at stake right now for Notre Dame over the next six to, eight, six to 12 months, when you look at these big deals that are happening with the TV contract, with the apparel deals, because honestly, if we're, if we're, if we really want to get to the nitty gritty of this, right, there's a lot of people saying, well, this guy's an NBC sports and I know you're going to want to comment on this. So I'm going to kind of set you up. Okay. This guy's an NBC sports. <laughs> The Big Ten just signed NBC. The Big Ten wants Notre Dame. This is another – they just got in the AAU that is, you know, key to the Big Ten as if, like, Notre Dame needed that. The Big Ten wouldn't accept Notre Dame without that. That's a different story for a different day. And so is this a move for the, for this? If anything, to me, these deals that they're about to sign are going to determine whether or not Notre Dame can remain independent moving forward. I've been told Absolutely. that the goal of the school is th- is the same. They want to remain independent. Uh, this is not the biggest, the, the only big change we're going to see at Notre Dame in the next year either. I think the president is someone else who is not going to be at Notre Dame a whole lot longer. We're going to see a lot of the upper level leadership kind of retire and, and, it, and time for the new era type of thing. So uh, th- th- there's going to be a lot going on, but this is going to be at the heart of it. If you can get the deal that right now we're hearing they're going to deal to, to get, that's the thing that's going to say Notre Dame can remain independent unless there's some situation where there's two leagues and they all say you can't, we won't play you, which is not anywhere close to happening right now. So that's why this is an important uh, time period, Sean, and why I do kind of like the transition period as opposed to just, okay, I'm retiring this date. This guy's going to take over that day. And then we go. I think having both of these guys in this situation involved in these negotiations are huge because the deals they're about to do are going to determine, like I said, the future of Notre Dame big All picture because if Notre Dame's getting a $35 million deal, a $40 million deal, including, you know, and then maybe you get the, whether that includes the AB, the ACC money, you may say, hey, boy, pretty quickly, you're just not going to, you're going to be so far away from those other schools. If their number is kind of what you and I are hearing, the the range is right now, the the floor and ceiling range is right now, that's all of a sudden saying, okay, Notre Dame is going to be just fine without a conference. And so, but it's not, the contracts aren't signed yet. It's not a done deal by any right. stretch. And so I think we're entering a very pivotal period for the future of the University of Notre Dame athletics. 
and and having someone with this background now beside Jack Swarbrick or along with Jack Swarbrick, I think is uh, the one thing that I can say for certain. I feel really confident about over the next six to six to eight months. I think this this part that part right there is going to be really important. The other stuff we'll figure out later, but that part right there because that whole Big Ten thing, Sean. I know you have some strong feel- feelings about about <laughs> the assumptions and the leaps that people are making about this. Well, yeah, and you know, like about a lot of other people, when I first saw that, wow, they're hiring the NBC Sports chairman. You know, like your what's what's your initial reaction going to be? Oh, well, that automatically means you know they've got a they're TV signing with NBC. Yeah, and they're, they're going to go to the Big Ten. That's the two yeah. leaps that people are making. And people, you know, the the Big Ten thing that you know not as much for me, but yeah, the people are making that leap. Here's I think the most important aspect of this what we've already talked about with peter babakwa he has negotiated tv rights contracts on both sides both with the pga with the tv partner and then as head of nbc sports with the nfl and with the big 10 those are his biggest ones there've been others you know like the premier league and some other stuff as well but just because he he's only been with nbc for four, you know, for four years, he hasn't, it's, it's not like he's an NBC lifer. Right. And because he's got that relationship means that like, he's, he's working, you know, he's indebted to NBC and he's going to try to make a deal, you know, for, for NBC. He's a Notre Dame alum first and foremost, you know, again, going back to the fact that he's a 93 alum to me, the fact that he's got the experience with NBC, he's working for Notre Dame. Now he no longer works for NBC. And again, he was only there for four years. The fact that he has all this background, though, with NBC and before that with the PGA negotiating other contracts means that he is he is arguably the most suited to be sitting in that seat and being a big part of the negotiation for the next TV contract. And, you know, again, the fact he's he's a Notre Dame guy before he's an NBC guy, I think. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so just you because hope. he's you hope. well, right. Yeah, I mean. You would obviously hope, but again, he's only been at NBC for four years. You know, his his affiliation with Notre Dame, because he went to Notre Dame, played football for Notre Dame, and has, has had this relationship, that goes back three decades plus. So to me, it's like this guy is going to have – he knows what NBC, as of right now – like what their numbers sure. are, what they can sure. afford when you're talking about negotiating a deal with them. And then if you open it up with other networks involved, I think it only benefits Notre Dame. Well, it's it's kind of funny if you think about it, Sean, when uh, a coach leaves Notre Dame and goes to a school that they're going to play, what's the first thought? Oh, no, he's going to give them Notre Dame's playbook. Right. Well, same thing applies here. He knows the he knows what NBC can afford to pay exactly Notre Dame for football. He knows what other networks are willing to pay. He's been in the negotiations because when he's working out deals with the NFL, and if you look at some of the things that that uh, you know that they've purchased in his time, he was part of NBC oversaw NBC's coverage of the. I'm just reading from the the release today. Oversaw NBC's coverage of the Summer and Winter Olympics, Major League Baseball, English Premier League, NASCAR, WWE, Kentucky Derby, IndyCar, NDA 500, Tour de France, French Open, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So when you're in those negotiations, you're not only aware of what you can do, you're aware of the numbers being thrown around by your competitors from other sides. You know where they are. You know the deal. You know the number that CBS threw out in order to get more from of the Big Ten. You know what Fox is working with. You know what ESPN is working with. You know their strengths and you know their weaknesses. Hopefully, he's able to use that to his advantage in these conversations. But even if this is sort of a, you know, in, in NBC's, somebody said this is NBC's Trojan horse. I mean, it's a bit provocative, but let's just say take that part of it out. But even if this is part of the negotiation with NBC, you're doing this because he's not going to leave NBC to go run Notre Dame knowing that NBC is about to screw Notre Dame on the TV deal. Right. Even if that was like, let's just say, Hey, look, we're going to, we're going to get you over there. We're going to get this deal. We want to be with you. You want to be with us here. We're going to go. You're telling me this guy's going to leave the, his head, the head of NBC sports to go to Notre Dame, knowing that they're going to about to get a really bad deal with NBC that, that, that does not allow Notre Dame to compete with the conference that he just signed was a part of signing a deal with NBC. 
right? So like that doesn't make a lot of sense. He's taking this move. He he. The only way you make this move, unless he's a complete idiot, and there's no way he's a complete idiot based on the success he's had and the things he's done, right? I mean, right. can we at least assume that? He knows that Notre Dame's about to get in a good financial situation with these deals. He's very aware of these deals. There's literally no one else they could have hired that would be more aware of these deals other than Jack Swarbrick staying. I mean, is that, is that fair to say? Yeah. So you've got to feel comfortable that if he's leaving NBC to come to Notre Dame, he knows that Notre Dame is in a good situation to either get a big deal from NBC or the other deals that are on the table for Notre Dame if they leave NBC. And so that's that's another reason that makes me feel like the numbers I was given yesterday make a lot of sense and potentially getting into the middle to upper echelon of that deal because you're not going to be able to hoodwink this guy if you're NBC, right? I mean, you're going to say, hey, well, you know, we can really afford this. Uh, no, exactly. No, that's, yeah, yes, you can. I know you can. <laughs> yeah. Right? We know the value that Notre Dame brings. And, and so I think from a pure business dollars and cents standpoint, Sean, that alone, this is a this is going to have an impact in the well, look, impact. And, and who does who does independence who values independence in this whole deal more than anyone else? It's it's Notre Dame alums, right? They're the right. ones who always talk about we you know we can't join a conference. We've got you know this is this is part of our identity. Jack Swarbrick is a Notre Dame alum as well, and we hear him talk about this all the time. And again, this guy himself is a Notre Dame alum who has played on the football team before so he knows that his legacy is is going to be attached to that as someone who is just now taking this helm so i don't think he is going to take that lightly at all you know when when talking about do we stay independent or do we join the big 10 or or whatever other conference so it's going to be interesting to see how it all plays out whether it is nbc whether it is him taking notre dame somewhere else i mean you you know my thoughts on this i'm done with nbc I, I just, you know, I, I'm tired of it. And, you know, part of me was like, well, hey, this guy knows NBC. Maybe he'll, but I'm like, yeah, but he's been part of the guy that that I think has kind of been involved in the fact that they just haven't taken Notre Dame football seriously enough. But again, he's looking at that from what's best for NBC standpoint. Now he's looking at it from the other standpoint where it's now what's best for Notre Dame. And uh, hopefully he, and I he, think that could things. be a grayer area, you yeah. know, if they, if they stay with Notre Dame, exactly how he's able to impact that going right. forward. Yeah. We're, we're, Right. Yeah. Because that's the that's been my big beef with NBC is obviously for a while I had a level of loyalty to NBC because they first struck the deal with Notre Dame. They're willing to take that chance. But after it's a while, it's like, okay, you guys are treating Notre Dame like your minor league. You send these announcers that have never done anything that to train to for the next job. Right. And 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 now some of those guys have been very good. They did that with Tony Dungy and he was great. I mean, I thought Tony Dungy was him and Mike Tirico as a combination were excellent. Yeah, I thought so. But as well. we always knew Mike Tirico was was eventually going to move up and move on to Sunday Night Football or doing other things. You know what I mean? That was, and and then you knew that Tony Dungy wasn't going to be here at Notre Dame for very long. You knew that wasn't going to be true. Drew Brees, and then you get to have to deal with Jason Garrett, and it's like, okay, yeah, they're not Doug Flutie, but at least they're, you know, but they're still not good enough. And and you know, Jack Collinsworth and Jason Garrett being your 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 play by play tandem. It's like, yeah, you wouldn't do that for NFL. Oh, well, and you, you wouldn't go through throw two guys out there that are just like, well, we've never heard of these guys for an NFL game, right? So why do that with Notre Dame? When this primetime deal starts this season, the 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 Big Ten play by play, you know, duo is going to be better than what Notre Dame yeah. has. Noah Eagle, I know a lot of people probably haven't heard Noah Eagle before. His dad is Ian Eagle. Yes, I know and, his dad. Right. And he's done, he's done like a couple of the he's he's been the LA Clippers TV voice for the last few years, you know, like right out of college. And it's, you know, again, it's it's like it's not a nepotism deal because you know, because like the name can get you in the door, but right. you have to be able to deliver. Now that's been different, I know, with the Jack Collinsworth situation, but but trust me, when you watch the first primetime game, I've 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 heard him a few times. He's done, you know, some of these, uh, you know, how the NFL uh, has done these Nickelodeon games, uh, mm-hmm. you know, for some playoff games the last couple of years. He's done some of those. I think he did a game for NFL Network last year. The guy has pipes, and he is he is legit. He 
the Big Ten booth is going to be better than what, uh, assuming Notre Dame is going to stay the same as what they had last year, the Big Ten booth in that primetime booth is going to be better than what Notre yeah. Dame had last Who's year. Who's the color guy for that? I'm trying to remember you know? now off the top of my head. I'll, um, I'll, I'll find it here. It's going to hit you like right in the middle of the show. We're going to be like yeah, a mid-sentence talking about something else, and you're just going to blurt out the guy's name like, oh, it's this. Like, oh, okay, great. Oh, it uh, is. Uh, it's Todd Blackledge. He's coming okay. over. From Todd ABC. Blackledge does a nice job. Yeah, he do, yeah. he's always done a nice job at ABC. Yeah. So yeah, it's it's going to be interesting, Sean. Those those aspects of it are are, are going to be fascinating. Those are ultimately de- deals that are done that are determined by NBC. But you have to use your leverage as, in the, this period to say, hey, look, we need insurances that the product is going to be better, and and that's going to be a big part of it because if this guy is worth his grain of salt he's going to at least somewhat try to get the pulse of the Notre Dame fan base. And and look, I know that fans aren't as important as they used to be. I realize that. I don't like it. But if fans don't like a deal that's going to be lucrative for you, guess what? You're not going to care. You're going to sign the deal, even if all your fans hate it, because that's that's your job. But I think a smart AD, and this is something where I, I don't think Jack Swarbrick had enough thought I don't think Jack Swarbrick put enough thought into what fans think about things and and his engagements with fans. I've never felt that he understood that. If this guy's smart, he's going to somewhat try to get a get a read into that and say, hey, look, what's the whole point of getting a TV deal? It's twofold, right? Number one is to get your money. But number two is what is the product that you're putting out there that's going to represent your institution? And would you not want the best that you can possibly get? Hey, look, we're going to be on TV or, you know, you're going to be doing our, you know, over half of our games. We need to know that you're taking this thing seriously and that you're going to put value in the production content. And honestly, to me, I could, I could, the, the, the booth is important, but it's like secondary to me. It really is. Cause most of the time I don't even listen to the, to play by play, but even when D- Dungy right. and Mike Tarico are doing it, when I'm watching the game, I'm not, I'm, I'm mute him anyway, because I'm doing it for analysis sake. And I don't want to be influenced by something Tony Dungy might be saying. I need to be able to look and see it myself. And I may watch it later because I enjoyed listening to Coach Dungy. And he's he's a, a brilliant football mind. But mm-hmm. I don't listen to that anyway. It's the production quality to me that I've always felt was severely lacking, in my opinion. The, the Peacock Network doing three spring games in a row and barely getting any better with all of them. Right. You know, it's like you clearly don't take Notre Dame as seriously as you do the NFL. And I get it because the NFL is a much more lucrative deal, but I want to see them. Uh, I want to see them to say, Hey, look, um, this is, this is something you need to start taking us more seriously because if not, we've got these other people that are willing to make these sacrifices and these changes for us. And hopefully he can kind of swing that a little bit. That, that would be fun. And Hey, look, here's something else I hope that they do if, as now as we're, we're talking pipe dream, Sean, it's okay for your Notre Dame broadcasts to have a Notre Dame slant. I'm not talking about from the booth. I'm not talking about I don't need the I don't need a Homer play-by-play guy or a Homer color guy. I don't. But can we please stop having Stanford and Miami and all these other schools have be the guys that are doing doing the work at halftime and pregame? Yeah. Can we please get more Notre Dame guys involved in this process? They don't have to be even the hires, but Make them be the guys that your TV people are interviewing. It's okay to, you know, you're a, it's a Notre Dame deal. You're not just covering college football and Notre Dame happens to be the game. This is a Notre Dame deal. It's right. okay yeah. to have Notre Dame people be your, who you interview at the very least. So I would hope that that would be something that they would improve as well. I don't, I don't have high expectations for that, Sean. But uh, do you get what I'm saying? Like, I don't need two homers in the booth doing a TV game. I, I don't, I don't, I don't think that's a good product. No, you, either. you don't have to be a Homer, but you know, there, and I realize a lot of people, if you're not a Notre Dame fan, you turn on the TV expecting a Notre Dame bias, I guess, anyway, even though they've mm-hmm. never put a Notre Dame person in that analyst booth, but you know, I, I would have no problem doing a three man booth. If that's the compromise, if you could get, whether it's, you know, like a Golic or a Jerome, Bet- whoever it happens to be, if you could get a Notre Dame alum in that booth and then you want to have another analyst in there and just make it a three man booth for some balance, I wouldn't mind that. But, you know, the question is, are they the best man for the job or the best person right. for the job? And right. I just I don't I don't think we've seen that with with a lot of whether it's analysis or, you know, 
obviously what we just had last year with the play by play. Right. And 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 if and if the best guy for the job is not a no name guy for that role, I'm good with that. What what I'm what I'm more referring to is is what we see before, during, and at halftime of these games. You there know, definitely like needs to be more actual yeah, Notre Dame flavor. They're because playing Notre Dame. It's a Notre Dame, Notre Dame home yeah. game, and we're listening you're on to LeVon the field Kirk- at Notre Dame. Right. right. We're listening to LeVon Kirkland get interviewed at halftime of the Notre Dame-Clemson game. How about you interview some former Notre Dame player? Right. You know what I mean? Like, why are we talking to – we're always interviewing someone from the other team, this whole fairness thing. I don't want fairness. It's a Notre Dame broadcast. You're going to ultimately yeah. be successful because you are getting the – higher majority of Notre Dame fans to tune in more and more frequently. And and honestly, if they were really smart, they would understand that the more Notre Dame slant you get, the more you're actually going to get teams that hate Notre Dame to listen because what do people want to see nowadays? I don't like it, but people want to be mad. People want to be enraged. They want to, you know, why do you, why did people watch Skip Bayless and Shannon Sharp yell at each other for a half an hour? It's not for the riveting analysis of sports. It's because they want to be mad. They want to yell want, back at the TV. Yes. <laughs> and so, like, if if you want to get some non-Notre Dame people to watch, who are you going to get to watch? Okay, Notre Dame fans are going to watch. The team of the opponent they're playing is going to watch. But let's do something to kind of get those Notre Dame haters to watch so they can scream at their television because we still get paid even if they're screaming at their television. And so I would actually lean into it a little bit more uh, but I just don't see that happening because I don't think they're smart enough to to realize that. Yeah, I, I think you're exactly right. You know, just just the fact that you're paying all this money to do Notre Dame home games and you veer away from, you know, really embracing Notre right. Dame as an on-air product. But again, maybe maybe that changes if there's some right. influence and some give and take. With, because with let's let's be real about this, right, Sean? If Brady Quinn or Mike Golick Jr., two names that are thrown in there, are doing color for Notre Dame, if Ryan Harris is – well, Ryan Harris might be a little bit different because Ryan's very outwardly pro-Notre Dame. But that's also say, he's doing, he's doing but, radio. Yeah. But if it was Brady Quinn or, or, or Mike Golick, they're not they don't they're not going to be like cute home, homers for Notre Dame. And I'd be willing to bet you that if Ryan Harris was in the booth for NBC, his – how he would discuss would be would change a little bit as well because there's a difference between rate as you know Sean there's a difference between the way you're doing radio and where you're doing TV because on radio people see nothing right you have to tell the entire story on TV there are certain things that people need to see they see I don't need to I don't need to explain every you know hey the Notre Dame comes out they break they're going trips to the to the field and you know, no, now there's a, mo- you don't need to do as much of that when you're doing, when you're doing play by play, because I can see that. Thank you very much. Uh, and so I think that to a degree, Ryan would change. He would be more of a, a pro Notre Dame guy, which I'd be fine with because he's really good. Him and Paul Burmeister are who I thought, I, don't, I mean, honestly, that should be the TV crew to me. Everybody talks about Brady Quinn and Gus. Look, let's be honest. Those guys work for the networks. They're not coming over here. If Brady Quinn wanted to come. Sure. Great. That's wonderful. Uh, I'd be totally fine with that. But you've got Paul Burmeister and Ryan Harris right there. There should never be a universe where your radio guys are significantly better than your TV guys. And that's been true at Notre Dame the last couple, at least the last the last couple years. Where Since Tarico's gone. Right. Anyway. Well, even yeah. with Tarico, Tarico was great, but the color got the, you know, the, except for the Dungey year, like when Drew Brees, I didn't think was that good. Doug Flutie was terrible. You know, but, uh, you know, I, I think Paul Burmeister does a very good job. And I think that Ryan Harris would do a very good job. At the very least, that should be your tandem. But we get stuck with Jack, Jack uh, Collinsworth and, and uh, Jason Garrett. Yeah. And I mean, you, essentially what Ryan Harris does right now on the radio, I agree. You know, you are doing, you know, they, he works for the Notre Dame radio network. Right. Though, and, and guys, in his place, you know, like Dan Deerdorf left ABC and he went to work for the Michigan radio network. Those kind of guys can essentially play that up. They can play yeah. up their fandom and their affiliation with those teams. I mean, that's, but essentially the, the way Ryan Harris is right now is exactly why probably NBC has never brought in a Notre sure. Dame alum and put in that booth sure. because that's what you now at the same time, you can coach that up. You know, you just right. tell them, you know, you can't, there are certain things that you can't do. I completely agree with you on the Burmeister front, you know, in terms of 
you know, the, the play-by-play quality because the guy does TV. He did TV play-by-play before he became the Notre Dame radio network play-by-play guy. He's done I, a couple Notre Dame games when yeah. Rico uh, and yeah, some filled in. yeah, and exactly. I thought he did a great job. Exactly. But the, I mean, they, they obviously don't want an over the top Homer analyst in the booth on, on TV. And nor, I think that that's why I. they've avoided it. No. Right. And I, nor I do I. I think right. that's why they've avoided ever doing that before. Yeah. But it's, it's another thing when you've got USC and Purdue and Boston college yeah. guys sitting in that. Booth. Exactly. Yeah. And that's what we've had to deal with for how many years, right? First was Brad right. Hayden being a USC guy. Then it was Doug. Well, then it was Todd Christensen, a BYU guy. Right. You know. Then it was who came after uh, Christensen. Um, you had like Bill Walsh in there for a period of time. Like this guy's right. literally coached against and beat Notre Dame. Why am I listening to like? Why do I have to listen to him? You know, talk about Notre Dame games. It's just it's always like why why are we always picking like rivals of Notre Dame? Exactly to, to do color for Notre Dame games. It makes no sense, and that's why it like Dungey no seemed like such a good fit, and yeah. I don't understand why. Well, and Mayock was that way too. May even though Mayock played at BC, I thought Mayock was great. Yeah. You know, I mean, he he was tremendous, and we don't get those guys enough. You know, and that's that's the that's the frustration that I think a lot of people have. So, we'll, we'll, I, you know, will will this this new hire have anything to do with that? I I I don't know. I don't know. But a guy can dream, right? <laughs> I think part of this too, Sean is is um. You know, it's it's going to be interesting to see how the uh, Notre Dame tenure for Jack Swarbrick is ultimately viewed. Because I think right now, it's very interesting. You have these 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 three groups of people when it comes to Jack Swarbrick opinion, right? You have the people that say, oh, he's done nothing but phenomenal things in Notre Dame. And then you have the group that have say, well, he I hate Jack Swarbrick. I can't stand Jack Swarbrick. They pick like three things that bad happen in football, and they're never going to forgive him for those, and they're going to ignore all the other things, and it's just I hate Jack Swarbrick. And then I think is the middle where I think most people should be, which is like anybody, there's things he did that I don't like, some things he did I despise, to be honest with you. But there's also a lot of things that he's done incredibly well. And when you really think back about where this – sports program was in 2008 and 2009 when he first took over. And then they look at Notre Dame now, barely a decade past that. What are we at? Like 13, 14, going into year 14 of the Swarbrick tenure, I believe. And you look at where they are now. I mean, there's some things that we should look at and say, you screwed up there. But you're going to have to look back, in my opinion, on the Jack Swarbrick era and say, but man, he took the he took Notre Dame athletics a very long way in a little over a decade, and um, we're all excited about what this football team is going to be. And uh, you know, some of it has to do with Jack Swarbrick. A lot of it has to do with the coaches and the teams and all that. But I mean, you, you, he's he's done a lot of good, Sean. And I have a feeling that the further away we get from him, the the more favorable people favorable favorable view people will have assuming that the three big hires he made out the door pan out. And that's Marcus Freeman, Niel Ivey, and Micah Shrewsbury. Ultimately, their success is going to determine how he's viewed, but his success goes way beyond that when you look at just bringing Notre Dame into the modern world. Because people are complaining about, about, you know, you had Tim Priester on, and there's a lot of people complaining about, what Brian Polian said, and I don't give a crap what Brian Polian said because he was part of the excuse making tandem at Notre Dame, where they would always blame something else. Oh, you can't recruit big time players until Marcus Freeman showed up. You know what I mean? Like, uh, oh, you can't recruit elite offensive players until Marcus Freeman showed up. Right? Uh-huh. I mean, it's just the excuse making bull crap. Hey, we we uh, we uh, lost to Northwestern and decided to go for two, and you know, in the second half when we're up eleven uh, because we don't have a chef. You know what I mean? Like, I can't stand that crap. Right. I get tired of that crap, you know, but, but my whole thing is if you're complaining about that now, go back and look at where it was when Charlie Weiss's tenure ended, ended. Exactly. And look at what the facilities were like then when their indoor facility was the loftest. And that was actually until somewhat recently, that was their indoor facility. Not that long ago. The loftest. And you look at where they are now. He's also done a lot of really good things during his tenure at Notre Dame that, that I think, if the hires he makes are successful, then people will start to look at those things 
more favorably as well. That's my opinion. If they're not successful, then people are just going to focus on the things he did that that they didn't like. And there's there's plenty of that as well. And when you're going to be the AD, it's like being president, right? You're going to do things that are just some people are going to love and some people are going to hate. It's just it's just the reality of it. But that that's going to be interesting. But it's ultimately going to be defined, in my opinion, Sean, by how well those three hires do for Notre Dame. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's and they're they're all relative, you know, like Neil Ivey came first and then Marcus Freeman, obviously not long after. And we just saw it Shrewsbury. So there's a lot that has to play out. Ivy's off to a good start with a couple of sweet 16s in the last couple of years. But like you look at that that tenure, 15 years Swarbrick had at Notre Dame. Moose Krause is the only other athletic director with a longer tenure at Notre Dame. He was he was the AD from 1949 to 1981, remarkably. And Swarbrick's got the next longest tenure. And I just saw something this way. I can't remember what the exact number of national championships are, but the national championships won by Notre Dame in that 15 years, no one else has. You know, no other athletic director has at, at any school across the country. Mm. You know, the, the only downside, I guess, if you want to put an asterisk or whatever, is none of them were in football, you know. So right. when you're talking Notre Dame. And that's ultimately, like, yeah. there's someone in the thing saying now, talking about how he hamstrung Marcus Freeman, and I'll never forgive him for that. And it's like, but that's just how some people are, right? They're going to take that couple things that they perceive to be as this negative thing and look at the football team never won. Because they don't care that the lacrosse team won a national championship. They don't care that the exactly. basketball won a national championship or it's nice, the men's but, basketball team that yeah. went to two elite eights or anything like that. They don't care about that. Oh, you got brand new facilities in basketball, whatever the case may be. It's Hayden hey, won a championship football and he did this one thing that I didn't like. I hated what he how he did how he how the whole thing with Tommy Reese. And not that I had a problem because my whole point with that whole thing with Tommy Reese was I'm pretty I'm pretty confident, like in, incredibly confident. That if Marcus Freeman would have been allowed to make whatever hires he wanted to, that he would have hired kept Tommy Reese on as offensive coordinator. I'm I'm very confident in that. But the way that it was done created an environment in which you almost created tension where none needed to exist. Mm-hmm. And there just were things like that. You know, the Andy Ludwig situation. And this has been my whole issue with Notre Dame going back to before Jack Swarbrick, but it's been one of the issues of Jack Swarbrick as well. Is there's the unforced errors that that just didn't need to happen. Right, and, and I think part of the reason that happened goes back to what I said earlier is he didn't always surround himself with the best people when it came to running the day-to-days of football and, and, and athletics. A mistake like that never would have happened in negotiations of for the, a new TV deal or an apparel deal or you know some deal with the you know college football playoff expansion because he he would have handled that himself and he would have surrounded himself with more competent people. But there's too many people from an athletic level, to me, in my opinion, I know you deal with this in other sports as well, Sean, where it's like, this is Notre Dame, and that's who you have in that position? Like, really? That That's the that's the best you can do at the University of Notre Dame? Is that right there? Come on, man. And I think that's the thing that I, that I think Jack Swart was a big mistake by Jack Swarbrick, was not having enough competent people in those positions. Uh, that maybe we're willing to say, hey, you know, maybe not question him because I think that can come across as like undermining and disrespectful, but be willing to say to push back, I guess, is another way saying, no, 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 we need to we need to be thinking about doing it this way. And I think that's something that, that is going to that. But to a lot of people, Sean, that overshadows so much of the other things that are going on and what have gone on and the fact that, you know, now we're the football team is a, a program that we expect to, you know, compete for playoff berths and championships and those type of things. The facilities need a lot of work in the goog, but the stadium now is outstanding. All the changes are there. You got a, you got an outstanding indoor facility. The new basketball facilities are supposedly like outstanding. I haven't seen them yet, Sean, but I, I know a lot of people say that they're, they're really good. Now you can probably speak to that greater. Mm-hmm. Those things are always going to be ignored because Jack Swarbrick was perceived to be a stumbling block to the football team getting where they need to be. Some of that is misguided. Some of that is, I don't know how I can argue with you on that. You know what I mean? Like, I don't think that was his intention, but that was the result. And, uh, you know, I think those are things, you know, you know some people are going to say, hey, you know, great job sm- being smart and keeping Kelly because look what Kelly did afterwards. And other people are going to say, you should have fired him in 2016 and then gone out and hired so-and-so. And those are just ultimately going to be things that people are going to debate until Notre Dame wins again. 
And if Notre Dame wins with Marcus Freeman, then you're going to have to look back and say Jack Swarbrick played a role in that because it will be partly due to the, the new, him hiring Marcus Freeman. Yeah. And then, of course, Indirectly. these yeah. new deals and such that he's going to do. Because, look, Notre Dame should never be using money as an excuse for anything. I've never bought. That's always been BS. No, I agree. But when these new deals are signed, I definitely don't want to hear that <laughs> that there's money issues or that you can't afford to have a top five highest paid coaching staff or that you can't afford to, you know, go go renovate the Goog and things now. No, you got the money. You just signed the deal with so and so. Well, that's going to go back to blah 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 bull crap. Make your football teams better, and then you're going to make even more money off of those investments that you can then put back into those other other aspects. But use this money to get the football program where it needs to be, the basketball programs where they need to be. Then when you start winning there and the more and more money starts pouring in, because this happens all the time, when teams win, donors start giving more money. Right. Uh, Non-donors become donors, right? The no, wealthy Notre Dame football fans become donors, right? I mean, that's all part of it. And um, if this guy's smart, he'll understand that we've got to figure out a way to make our football team competitive for championships without sacrificing the heart of what makes Notre Dame Notre Dame. I still care about that. I don't know if the leadership at Notre Dame still cares as much about you know that, to be honest with you, but I do. Um, so if they can find a way, and, you, and I think they can do it, they just have to say, we're willing to make certain changes, and we're going to do certain things, and we're, we're going to be willing to in, – uh, to to make NIL a big part of who we are for our student athletes. Do not do it for recruiting, but for our student athletes. We're going to go make sure that our facilities are. There's a difference between the arms race and what we're talking about. Arms race is I don't need a freaking pool inside. You know, I don't need a slide inside my football facility like it was like Clemson or Georgia, right? Like I don't, uh -huh. some of these things, like dude, I don't need that. I don't I don't need air conditioned helmets, you know, or or whatever other silly thing that some teams are doing. But there absolutely needs to be a dining hall for, for athletes. There absolutely needs to be that. There absolutely needs to be make sure that the weight room and strength conditioning programs are top-notch. And I've done said all this before. You need to absolutely make sure that the your, that your mental health department that you have for student athletes, especially in today's world, is as good as anybody in the country. You need to be trendsetters in those areas that do not sacrifice the integrity of your school. Like, hey, we're going to start paying high school athletes millions of dollars to come play football here. Or, or we're gonna, you know, we're gonna lower our academic standards so a kid that can barely read and write gets into Notre Dame, and we'll just get him through for three years until he gets in the NFL, or get him through for a year until he's the number one in the, you know, NBA draft pick. We're not gonna do that. I support that. I'm with that. But that's not the stumbling block that's keeping you from winning. This notion that academic standards, no, that's bull crap. I've pointed. Keon Keeley was a three five, right? Peyton Bone was a three three. I think GPA wise. Dante Moore was a 4.0 student in his last two years of high school. Academics were not your issue in last year's recruiting class. There were other issues. Some you can control, some you can't. Right. And until you get an AD that understands, hey, we got to stop pinching pennies and be willing to – because Notre Dame, in my opinion, is too much into – they're the kind of people that want to save all their money and then put it in the stock market and then let it grow and do all that. And that's fine. But to me, the true heavyweights and you know financial heavyweights are people that understand the value of that with part of my portfolio, but then also saying, but I'm a business and part of growing a business is I'm going to, I'm going to invest in growing here because I know that investment is going to result in us making a lot more money. Look at our business, Sean. I mean, you look at what this company was making a couple of years ago, and now I'm paying a whole lot more out than I was two years ago, but so, you know, those, those checks hurt a little bit sometimes, <laughs> but you know what, but we're bringing in a lot more now too, because you guys are the return on that investment has far exceed, you know, has far exceeded my expectations of where we could be. Right. I mean, that's, that's the whole point. And that's how I feel like right. with the football program is you got to be willing to spend money to make money sometimes. Exactly. And you got to find that balance. And I feel like Notre Dame doesn't understand that balance enough. Uh, and they they use phrases like, well, we're not going to get into an arms race. No one's asking you to. I don't need I don't need you to have all these silly things that some of these other people. I don't need you to have an arcade in the Goog. I do not care about that. I don't. I really don't. But the, you know, these things over here, these should be non negotiables. And and these are the things that really matter to you building a championship football team. And until they're willing to embrace that, until the new until they find an AD that's willing to embrace that, they're always going to get in their own freaking way. 
And I think that's the legacy that some people were just never able to get past Jack Swarbrick, even when you look at the billions of dollars that they've spent investing in the football program. When you look at the crossword, well, about a billion dollars, the crossroad project, the indoor facility, you know, what they've paid coaches, the new field, all those, the new basketball facilities. I mean, you're getting up to around a billion dollars. But the people say, yeah, but look how much they've made. Those sports have made as well. And I, and that's where that's where you kind of get into some like, yeah, okay, well, we're going to see if this new guy gets it. And that we don't know, you know, but um, that's what makes the whole Jack Swarbrick's legacy conversation, Sean, very interesting and very interesting. No, for sure. And, you know, again, I think a lot of it, a majority, a majority of it is going to be tied to the success of these three head coaches that you talked about, you know, from right off the top that he hired Marcus Freeman, Neil Ivey. Uh, Micah Shrewsbury, that's that's going to go a long way toward how we feel about it. I mean, when you look over the course of these 15 years, I mean, there were definitely a lot of good things that he has done. You know, like you've talked about, and I agree with everything that you're talking about, there needs to be more reinvestment in, yeah. in what you're bringing in. It, it can't just be, you know, okay, we're going to push this to the bank because the more you continue to invest, especially where we are right now, you're right. We don't, you know, they don't, they don't need all these crazy bells and whistles, mm -mm. but they need, you know, the minimum stuff like a, like a dining hall you right. know, that, for, for the team. That should be something no that's one a, is disagreeing about right now, Sean. Right. That's a bare minimum. I think. Right. The, the, the let me ask you this, Sean. Will his legacy be complete if the basketball, let's say Niel Ivey wins a championship or two, just for argument's sake. Micah Shrewsbury takes him back to the Final Four, even wins a national championship. Will that be enough if Notre Dame doesn't win a football championship? I mean, I feel like it was, that still won't really be enough if they don't win a football championship. But I really feel like they have to win a football championship for, for your legacy to truly to be complete as an AT at Notre Dame. That's just my my opinion. I agree. It, because it's it's all about football you know again there there are people who care about these other sports we all you know to to some degree care about sure. these other sports but bigger picture people donate that money by and large because of how they feel about Notre Dame football right. and the connection to Notre Dame football that's right. and and we're what at 35 years now and counting since Notre Dame football last won a national championship. Right. And that's, it, it's, it's, it'll be great if both basketballs win another national championship, but it's, it's still going to be about what happens with the football team right. at the end of the day. Yeah. It's going to, it's going to be interesting, Sean. I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing kind of how this goes. I, I think sometimes the unknown can be fun. You know, it, it can be entertaining. It's like, okay, well, we don't know what's going to happen, but at least like with Jack Swarbrick, you're, you're like, man, I hope he does this, but you're like, but after 15 years, it's, I mean, it's, let's be honest. He's, yeah, he's not changing, right? I mean, <laughs> you just, he's not changing. And, uh, you know, now there's that fresh blood that you can kind of, maybe there's that, that time for optimism now, but I, you know, I, I do think that, that when you ultimately look back at Jack Swarbrick's tenure, there was a lot more good than there was bad during the tenure. And, um, you know, he had to see them through some, some issues and there were certain things he did to see them through those things that I had a problem with. I, I still dislike how they kind of just, I feel like they surrendered with that academic scan quote unquote scandal where I felt like, why'd you surrender? You did what you're, you did the right thing. You found yeah. out this was happening. You dealt with it, you know, and then you just, you just kind of surrendered with the vacating of the losses and things like that. They're just, whereas you watch the, in the North Carolina people, they're literally running fake classes for athletes. Oh yeah. And they basically punked the NCAA to the point where saying, okay, do something about it. Oh, yeah. you want to do that? We're going to see in the NCAA back down. They're cowards. But Notre Dame just kind of rolls over whenever the NCAA kind of slaps them on the wrist for something they shouldn't be slapped on the wrist for. They, they should, that the whole academic thing, they should have been praised for how they handled that. Hey, a few kids cheated. Some girl who wasn't, you know, an employee, she was a tutor and did something like what, like the training staff or something like that. Right. Mm -hmm. They, they were cheating. We found out they were all suspended. We did that. We said, Hey, this isn't who we are. We self-reported. We did it the right way. And the NCAA smacks their name in the face for it. 
right? And then Notre Dame, you know, kind of fought it to a degree and then eventually just rolled over. North Carolina is running fake classes for athletes and nothing really ever happened. Right. Because North Carolina said, we know ultimately you can't do a dang thing and we're going to show it because we're going to punk you all the way until you just give up and hope that everybody forgets about it, which now they have, right? How many, how many wins did North Carolina vacate for the fact that they had basketball players, I think on a championship team, taking fake, not real classes, which to me is way worse than some girl writing a paper for me. Right. You know? So um, those are, some of those things are things that I get a little frustrated by, but it doesn't, it doesn't ignore the fact that when I go to Notre Dame stadium, and I think about what it looked like my first year covering the team in 2010. And I think about what it's like now. Facilities-wise, it's great. But you know what's not as good? They showed a lot more respect to the people that covered the program back then <laughs> when I covered the team than they do now. So those are other things that I look at and say, you know, you're, you've created an unnecessarily adversarial relationship with people that just you didn't need to do. Fans, you know, media – and. You wonder how the new what the new AD's approach is going to be to those type of things. I hope it's a little bit different. I don't yeah. think Jack Swarbrick did those things on purpose. I just think he didn't care, so he delegates to someone else, and then they're the ones making those changes. Ultimately, is what I think is going on. So we'll, we'll see how it all we'll see how it all turns out. But uh, it's a very complicated tenure, that's for sure. I think so. In my opinion. What do you, What do you think are a couple of the biggest feathers in his cap out of this well, whole I just, thing? I mean, really, Sean. Uh, I don't think he gets enough credit for what he did to fend off the first attempt at mega conferences because Notre Dame is in such, you remember this is about 2010 and 11. And it was when Texas was talking about going to the PAC 12 and there was going to be these big super conferences. And right. remember the PAC 12 was kind of big time back then. Yeah. And uh, you know, and, and, and he had a big role in sort of, Hey, Texas, you stay where you are. You do this, you do that. Don't do this. You know, he was a played a, he was a heavy mover and shaker in lim eliminating the first attempt at super, super conferences. We like say, well, Hey, they're going to have that anyway, but Notre Dame is in such a better place to wield power now in that universe than they were then. I mean, they were a dumpster fire of a program when that was going on back then. If you remember Sean, I mean, they mm -hmm. were just coming out of the Weiss era. Kelly hadn't done anything yet. And so you now Notre Dame is is, is seat, got a seat at the table for college football playoff expansion, you know where it's like, hey, this is going to happen. Let's make sure that we do this in a way that's going to help us. And so I think that's that's a big one to me. And then the other one for me is just walk around campus for five minutes near the athletic facilities, and then just close your eyes and remember what it was like fifteen years ago. Absolutely, and I think that's a big part of it as well. Campus looks. View. Like if if you haven't been to campus <laughs> since Jack Swarbrick took over 15 years ago, oh. I mean it's it's a completely different looking campus, and, and the facilities are mm -hmm. are a huge huge part of it. Yeah. And I mean, you know, like you talk about fending off the super conferences, and I and I know that there's not a lot of people who like this ACC agreement, but you know, it's it really, you know, it did. This agreement with the ACC, it is it has helped Notre Dame maintain its independence, and uh, you know, college football especially is already at a completely different place than when they joined yeah. the ACC. What's what's that been? How many years has it been now? It's like thirteen, right? Is, is when it was it announced at this point. Yeah, yeah, thirteen well, was yeah. But I mean, that is that has helped Notre Dame maintain that independence, and it yes. gave them a fallback, you know, in case some of these seismic shifts happened and, and yeah. so far they're, they're able to keep that. And by the way, it also, you know, they, they get a cut of that TV money as well. I've never understood the pushback to the ACC deal. I actually think that was a great deal. Mm -hmm. The big East was dying. I have no desire to go to the big 10. I guess that's part of it too, is if you're always someone who deep down secretly wants Notre Dame to be in the big 10, then you're not like them going to the ACC. What other conference would it have made sense for Notre Dame to leave for at the time? Not the Big Ten, I don't think. Right. You have so much more in common as an institution with schools in the ACC than you do with the Big Ten, other than geography. The only thing Notre Dame has in common with the majority of the Big Ten schools outside of maybe what, Northwestern and then Michigan to a degree uh, is geography. That's it. Yeah. 
You have yeah. nothing else in common with most of the Big Ten. You have a lot in common with Duke. You have a lot in common with Georgia Tech. You have a lot in common with teams like Virginia, teams like that, even though they're a public school. It's a very high level liberal arts institution. And so you have a lot more in common with Miami as an institution than you do anyone in the Big Ten other than Northwestern. Because a friend of mine was like, well, why is, why is Miami getting the AAU? Are they a good academic school? And I'm like, yeah, it's a very good academic school. It, just people don't think that because they think of the U and – you know, that whole persona, but there was like, there was the football program. And then there was the, I mean, the, I thought the U documentary did a great job of, of kind of explaining the difference between the football program and the rest of the school uh, and, and how it really was. So uh, to me, I've always felt the ACC deal was great. And I think it's been huge for recruiting. I mean, we're talking about how well they've done in Virginia and North Carolina and Georgia, that a lot of that has a has to do with the fact that these kids have grown up. If you think about it now, Sean, kids that are going into their senior year, kids that are going into uh, the 2024 recruits, right? You're talking about kids that were seven, six, seven, eight years old when Notre Dame joined the ACC. So they, so these kids in Virginia and North Carolina and South Carolina and Georgia have grown up watching Notre Dame come to their state every year and play football games that you grow up in that. And all of a sudden Notre Dame becomes more of a, yeah, I know Notre Dame. I've seen them play. They play so-and-so and And there's, it it opens up that part of the country, which Jack Swarbrick, I think was a a, a wise to notice this. That was a, because if you're, if you're smart and you want to follow recruiting, you've got to know population shifts. Mm -hmm. You can't say, well, yeah, Lou Holtz recruited this player out of Michigan and that player of Pennsylvania and this, and they should recruit those areas more. I, I always said this, Sean, go look at the electoral college numbers for Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Michigan in 1988 when Ronald, Re- when uh, it was, uh, that would be Bush and, um, was it Bush and Dukakis, right? When they were running for president in 88. Right. Go look at the, the 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 electoral numbers for those states, compare them to like Georgia, Florida, North Carolina, then, and then go compare it now. And what you'll realize, there has been a seismic population shift in the nation in those 35 years, which is going to impact where players are coming from. Right. And there's just a ton more kids. I did that article the other day, Sean, where I talked about the top five states in producing NFL talent in North Carolina and Georgia were both in the top five. You're now playing teams from those states pretty regularly. And you're playing on the East Coast pretty regularly because of that ACC deal, whether it's the Notre Dame football team or the basketball teams always playing games there, the baseball team and stuff like that. So I think the ACC deal has been great for Notre Dame yeah. and it's, it's getting them playing games in front of one of the two regions that's has seen the most population shift in the last 20 years, the Southeast and then the Southwest are the two areas where we've seen giant population shifts. Cause that's where jobs are right. As manufacturing jobs go away and those things like that and things get shipped overseas, blah, 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 blah. People look for jobs, and those jobs have been in the South. And so that's where people go, right? And so you've now got signed a deal that gets your football team and your basketball team and your baseball team and your other sports playing in front of those of those schools every single season. And I think – so I think the ACC has been great. And I think something else that, that Jack Swarbrick should be remembered by is he played a pretty big role in the 2020 college football season happening. Very big role. Yeah, absolutely. As well. Absolutely. I think that's easy to forget. <laughs> at, you know, just like look at look at the Big Ten that everyone thinks that, you know, not everyone, but a lot of people think Notre Dame should just jump over to. They were the Big first. Big Ten was to- dying to cancel football that year. Yeah, they did. They canceled it. That was the first decision Kevin Warren had to make. He's getting all the pats on the back now for the TV contract that he ended up signing. And then, you yeah. know, by the way, little details of that seem to slip through the cracks. But, yeah, I mean, he canceled the football season. Yes. Pac-12 canceled the football season. And, and they John, didn't bring it back until after Notre Dame and the ACC. Exactly. And not only did they cancel, he tried to get other conferences to cancel. Mm-hmm. So he tried to get the Big 12 to cancel. And if Notre Dame doesn't join the ACC, they would have pro- it would have probably – the SEC probably would have been the only team, really, the only Power 5 playing that year. Right. Maybe the Big 12. I think the ACC would have stopped playing if Notre Dame doesn't join. I I, I do. And so you talk about the Big Ten playing. There's two. There's two people responsible, in my opinion, for the Big Ten playing football in 2020. It's Jack Swarbrick and Jim Harbaugh. That's it. Because Harbaugh and his team were about the only team that I can remember that made a lot of noise 
a lot of noise about this isn't right. We should, we want to play. We need to play. And their president at the time was, was one of those guys along with Kevin Warren, just dying to get the football season canceled. And he's since been fired and, and, in shame and, and those type of things. And he was not a good guy either, but those are the two guys to me that if it's not for those two guys and the moves they did in completely different ways, I don't think, I don't know that the big 10 plays in 2020. Cause if Notre Dame doesn't play the big 10 doesn't play. Yeah. And, and that was a playoff year for Notre Dame. It was a big year for Notre Dame. Yep. So there's been a lot of good that's come out of the Jack Swarbrick tenure. And that's what makes the unnecessary stub subbing of your toe, uh, important like people talk about well brian kelly did a great job turning the program around after 2016 no he didn't jack swarbrick did jack swarbrick's the person who drove the hire of mike elko and chip long and and they're the ones that are 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 played the big role bob diaco called brian kelly was getting ready to hire a guy from stanford or u from usc strength program after 2016 some guys like you've got to be kidding me i remember not being happy about it (laughs) bob diaco calls him because remember that year sean that was when diaco got fired like really late Uh it was like january they they fired him late so they didn't have to pay him right so diaco calls kelly and he says hey i got the strength coach you've got to hire and so what kelly was going to try to do is get them two to there to be co-strength coaches together and the other guy didn't want any part of that and so that's how matt but that's not who brian kelly went out and got you know what I mean? If Bob Diaco doesn't pick up the phone and call him, we're dealing with the U.S. And if you remember, USC wasn't exactly a juggernaut mm-hmm. in strength conditioning at the time. And so it was Jack Swarbrick that did a lot of that stuff that was responsible for the turnaround at Notre Dame. As he went out and said, hey, we are gonna we need to get these guys and get that. Because what people, a lot of people don't know, Kelly was looking for, you know this, Sean. Kelly was and his agent were looking for, he wanted out. Right. They were trying to get any kind of job. They, they tried to push the U, the LSU job on them. LSU kind of laughed at them at the time. And they hired Tom. I'm like, bro, you just went at four and eight. Like, I, I, I would get, I get strung up if I hired you. What right do you now. say? Wasn't there like talk about the Eagles again or like some yeah. other NFL team? Yeah, at that I point? think Lions like maybe was, something like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I mean, he was dying to get out of Notre Dame. And so while he's doing that, Jack Swarbrick's over here bringing in Mike Elko. You know, getting Chip Long. And then Kelly gets on board at the end. And that's not that's not rumor. That's coming from very, I'll just say this, very co- good sources on those negotiations. And I'll just leave it at that. Hmm. But, um, you know, he, he's done a lot of good things. A lot of good things. It's just the the stub stubbing of the toe unnecessarily things that kind of frustrate you. Because you can see when Jack cares about something, he gets it done. Yeah. And so it's like they could have had this other things that we're talking about. They could have had this stuff done years ago if it was a priority to him. And that's that's kind of been the frustration for me. And sometimes I think his ego would get in the way a little bit. You know, hey, I did a great job with Elko and Chip Long, so let me make sure that I got Tommy Reese here, you mm-hmm. know, before I hire a head freaking coach. Right. You know, and just some things like that that you just look at and say, man, you let it be known that you're willing to pay Tommy Reese whatever Alabama would pay him, but you can't buy, you can't pay the freaking buyout for Utah, you know, to get Andy Ludwig, you know. So all that kind of stuff is like that's the stuff that people focus on a lot more, and I think I understand it. I just wish more people could say, "Hey, take a step back, look at this holistically," and say, "Yeah, I didn't like that, 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 but man, he's done a lot of good things at Notre Dame as well." Right. And took over a time when Notre Dame. I mean, you remember how bad Notre Dame's football field looked like at the end of seasons? Oh yeah, the last three, four years before the turf came in. Mm-hmm. I was like, guys, this is ridiculous. Absolutely, you know, pushed back against a lot of the the old heads that didn't want the scoreboard, you know, and just I mean, there's just been so many good things he's done for Notre Dame and college football that I just have a hard time looking at his tenure and saying it's anything less than a a really good tenure. It's you're never going to, I can't say great because ultimately your success is defined by what Sean did you win a championship? championships? Yep. And he didn't at, in football. They've won a lot in other sports, women's basketball, you know, lacrosse fencing's won 112 championships, <laughs> you know, but it's football, but um, it just, that tends to overshadow a lot of the other good things that I think he's done in his tenure. Yep. But he's just done a couple things. I think Sean, that some people just view as like unforgivable sins, and I think that's kind of odd uh, for people that uh, root for a, a Catholic institution. <laughs> I just find that a little very true. Catholic, but I just find that a little bit strange. It's yeah. an unforgivable sin. Uh, really? 
<laughs> okay, sure. Go to confession. Right. I need to step out for just a minute. I'll be right back. Okay. Yeah. All right. So that's going to kind of, that's going to kind of wrap up. I think this part of the conversation here. Um, it, look, we we don't know a lot about Pete Pete Bavacqua in regard to specifically what he's going to do, but we're going to learn over the next seven or eight months, and we'll we'll continue to to try to talk to people and get as many as many good sources and intel as we can on uh, on what he's going to bring to the table and uh, the changes he's going to make or not and go from there. So we're, we're going to move on to the mailbag next. We don't have a ton of questions just yet, but if you guys want to get your questions in, start dropping them in now and we're going to die, jump over to the mailbag in a second. But before we go to the mailbag, folks, do us a favor. Hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. And of course, some of these questions are going to still be about this topic, but hit that notification bell, share this podcast, give us a five-star review. Check out our merch store down there. And hey, listen, if you sign up for the message boards at boards.irishbreakdown.com, if you haven't done so, come on, guys. You got to sign up. It's uh, it's definitely worth it. But you also get a discount to the merch store. So if you want to buy some merch and you're not on the message board, sign up for the message board and uh, and we'll go from there. And um, and uh, we'll get you an e- I'll get you an email. You'll get your your uh, your discount code in there and all that kind of stuff. So definitely take advantage of that. So we're going to jump into the mailbag now. And we're going to start off with a question from Maximus. Maximus asks, I have full confidence in Pete. You don't leave chair of NBC Sports a tier below C-suite for Notre Dame AD if you don't love the school. Well, Maximus, it's it, it goes beyond that. I mean, look, you can love a school and and not be good at your job, or you can love a school and and say, hey, look, I, I love the school, but, uh, you know, look, I don't know if um, – I don't know if uh, my my alma mater is a position to be successful. I mean, smart lawyers, smart business people, smart anything, they're going to look at certain situations and say, yeah, I, that's always been a dream of mine, but man, that place is a mess right now. You know, it's like, it's always been my dream to to work at Blockbuster, to run Blockbuster, but then when you, you're ready to take over, it's they just closed down 500 stores. I like, guess yeah, this may not be the right time to, to jump in and invest or, you know, run a, a blockbuster unless you're that one random one that's still open out in Washington. So I think it's also that, 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 yeah, he's, he, he, he may, you know, love Notre Dame, but I think he also recognizes the opportunities that are there for Notre Dame right now as well. And, and, uh, looks at it and says, Hey, uh, you know, this is something that I think I can, I can play a role in taking to the next level. I hope that's, the what's behind you know his decision to take this job and so we're going to find out here soon enough but i i don't know if um the only thing i would somewhat push back on and i and i agree with most of what you're saying is i don't think necessarily running a, a tv network right now it automatically it means that you're going to be a, a successful there's a lot of i would argue there's a lot of people running tv departments in different aspects that are just not good at their job which is why they're failing. I, I hope that this isn't the case. I, I honestly can't speak specifically to this example and, and Pete, because I just don't watch enough of the sports that NBC uh, is in charge of to have an opinion on whether or not he's done a great job. Like I don't watch formula one. I don't watch premier league. I don't watch, I used to watch wrestling all the time as a kid and a, and a young adult. I don't watch that anymore. So there's just not a lot of things I can say, hey, I, I watched Formula One. They do a great job. Or, you know, as I told you all before, I don't really watch NFL football anymore. So I can't – I don't know what the – the was it Sunday night football? I think NBC still has. I don't I don't know what kind of job they're doing on that. So I, I, I can't speak to that. But I would have to think that if he's making that move – in the middle of these negotiations with these other aspects that he sees Notre Dame and being in a position to be successful. I, I have to think that. And so, you know, we're going to find out, but um, yeah, I, I have to think there's some level of confidence that Notre Dame is a, is a, or you don't want to jump on a sinking ship. Right. And, and, and he would know if Notre Dame was, and the fact that he's making this move makes me think that he sees Notre Dame being in a great position and he could play a role in taking it to another level would be my would be my guess so sean we'll go ahead i'll go ahead and pull these questions up and then you can read them and then we'll go okay we'll dive into them. all right from andre looking at this big picture perspective with the ad stepping down how does this affect notre dame's next tv contract as well as sports overall 
you know, I, we, we kind of talked about this earlier, Andre. I, I feel like this is something that should help Notre Dame. And Sean laid this out pretty well early in the show is you're, you're hiring a guy that is very, I mean, this guy's head of NBC sports. He's very well aware of what the negotiations look like between Notre Dame and NBC and other networks. If he's not the one that was doing them, he might've been the one doing them along with, you know, other aspects of, of the, of the, the, the people that run the, the, the financial, the finances at NBC. He's very well aware of, of, um, where those things are. So I, I have to think that that's a feather in Notre Dame's cap a little bit, as Sean pointed out earlier. I, I will, how much of an impact will ultimately have that? I don't know, Sean, because they are pretty far down the road in these negotiations, but I have to think that, that this is going to be one of those things that's going to help Notre Dame get, get across the, the, the finish line with a deal that, that you're very happy with as an institution and as a fan base. That's how I, how I see it. Uh, I completely agree. And I, I think that this is, this is going to be an asset for Notre Dame, having someone who's familiar with NBC's financials and exactly, you know, he knows exactly how high they can go coming over from NBC sports. I don't think it's a rubber stamp for NBC sports. And, and again, when you look at his background, when he worked for the PGA, he negotiated a big TV contract for the PGA and as as head of NBC Sports, he's negotiated, you know, like you were just just talking about NBC's Sunday night deal with the NFL. And, and, you know, there's there's a huge list from the Olympics to the Premier League and, of course, the Big Ten contract that he just did as well. So he's worked on both sides of this thing, you know, working TV deals. And so to have someone like that, who's also a Notre Dame alum, I think it's a huge asset for Notre Dame. Yeah, I, uh, uh, I, I may, maybe it's wishful thinking, but I, I just tend to think I, I'm more. I'll say this, Sean. I'm more optimistic after some of the things I've learned in the last few days that this TV deal is going to be big for Notre Dame, like really big for Notre Dame. And I, it just, it doesn't make sense for Notre Dame to sign a deal, but with a network as Notre Dame, if you're now planning on going to a conference. It just right. doesn't make a lot of sense. So if Notre Dame signs a TV deal in the next, uh, I don't know, six to six to ten, twelve months, then that tells you that their plan is to stay independent. Otherwise, they'd be right now. It'd be because again, these TV deals with the Big Ten aren't exactly done, as we come to find out, right? Because uh, Kevin Warren didn't Kevin Warren didn't leave them necessarily done. So if Notre Dame intended to go to the Big Ten, now's the time to throw your weight around as a future Big Ten member to improve the Big Ten deal. Mm -hmm. And I've heard nothing to make me to make me think Notre Dame has any concern about that other than saying maybe using that to leverage their own deal. Right. And so that leads me to believe that that Notre Dame does want to stay independent. And 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 if this entire time this this process has been going down, like like I said, this is a guy whose name I heard over a year ago when, a, when a, a friend of mine who's a big donor took me out to lunch and was talking about this guy as a name to, to keep in mind. That was a year ago. That was last summer. So for at least a year, this guy has been working on this job being his. So he's going to be working in these kind of deals with a, a, a Notre Dame positive slant, in my opinion. You know what I mean? Yeah, I completely uh, agree. As far as getting Notre Dame. So that's, that's why I feel a lot better about that specific aspect of it. Independent, well, I guess pun intended, like a little <laughs> bit of the Big Ten and whatever's going on with the Big Ten. All right, here we go. What are the top three things you'd want the incoming athletic director to do for Notre Dame football? Ooh. Well, one, Sean, we kind of talked about, right? Like uh, expansion and renovation of the Goog that also includes getting a a – not a training table, a eating facility for student athletes mm -hmm. where food is prepared there and served there and they can eat there. And I understand why Notre Dame has been hesitant to the, for this. I get that because Notre Dame rightfully values the overall college experience for its athletes. And I think that's something Notre Dame should never sacrifice entirely. 
But if you also care about the well-being of your student athletes and, and with what we know now about the importance of nutrition and caloric intake compared to outtake and, you know, being able to provide student athletes with these things and get them on specific dietary regimens, if you really care about what's best for student athletes, you have to take that into consideration as well and weigh that with this other holistic aspect of it. Because the whole pushback from Notre Dame is actually coming from a place of not just about not wanting to spend money. It's, hey, we want them living in the dorms with other students. We want them going to class with other students. We want them to be going to eat with other students. We want them to be students. And I think that is something that I find admirable about Notre Dame, that they don't just seclude their athletes like some other big schools do from the rest of the student body where you only really see them at parties and at class sometimes. Let's be real. <laughs> I think that's important. But in this one, I think they need to give way a little bit and say, hey, this is this is what's best for those student athletes as people as well, because this is the way they're not the normal student body. Student body's not putting in the exertion and burning the calories right. and, and the wear and turn their bodies that the football and the basketball and the lacrosse and the fencing and the soccer and pick a sport uh, are doing to their bodies. We need to make sure that we're providing them with the proper nutrition. And I'm not talking about just football. Football is going to be the one that pays for it, but it's one of those things that benefits the entire uh, athletic department. Those are important things that if you truly care about the holistic aspect of the student athlete, this is something you should take a lot of pride in. I think they're trying, they're finally figuring that out. Yeah. And then, but still make sure like one thing I don't want, I don't want dorms that are for athletes only. I don't, I don't believe in that. I like the idea of, of having these young men and these young women be actual student athletes and the student part coming first. But in this area, they need to make a change. That's my first one, Sean. What's, what's the first one that kind of pops in your head? No, I completely agree with that. That would be at the top of my list as well. And it's something we just, you know, we 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 talked about earlier this week. You know, I, I'm I, I guess a little bit more on the fence and like, do they actually need to prepare it there versus is it good enough, you know, like if they're preparing it, you know, in the not the dining facility, but you know, it gets like the, challenging yeah. to have the kind of consistency and to be able to feed all the, cause you, what you're going to feed your football players is going to be different than what, cause you're gonna have some specialization to this, right? Like exactly. your exactly. women's lacrosse team is not going to have the same meal plan as your men's lacrosse team, much less the football team. Mm -hmm. And, and so there needs to be some specialization to where, Hey, you know, we're, we're eating here and that this time and this other time. And I, and I think there's just a lot of value to being able to prepare it right there. And to be able to say, hey, look, the football team comes here, the basketball team is coming there, and we're just we're just we're working through it. We're getting these things prepared. They're right there. They're going through it. It's fresh. It's hot. It's healthy. It's right. It's right there. Uh, and then if you need to move it to a, you know, hey, we're going to prepare this, and the football team's going to eat it over here. Then you're just moving it from one part of the building to the other part, not having to put it in a truck and ship it across campus. And so some people might not think that's a big deal. I do. Uh, I just think it's important to be able to, to have the food there. And, and again, you don't need a ton of space. If you're going to be making a big facility to, to have your entire football team be able to eat there with some other student athletes, then you can make room for a, a kitchen in, in the back. So I, I do think that's something that's important. Plus, it gives you opportunities to say, hey, look, we're going to, you know, we're we're going to have this specialized meal. We're going to do something different. We're going to, you know, we're going to go over here. And then you've got the place where you can you can do those type of things. So I think I think that's important. I do. I think the the preparate being able to prepare it there, I think is, is it's not as important as having the facility that can host everybody, but I just feel like those other places where the food is being prepared, they're 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 kind of split between half and a, okay, this is what we're doing for students, this is what we're doing there. I also think that when you have this move, Sean, it's gonna be an even more specialized meal plan. Cause right now I think it's like just like what one meal a day. I think it's really what they prepare, like one full meal a day. I think so, yeah. Whereas now it's 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 multiple meals. It's the snacks in between. It's the protein shakes. It's all that stuff needs to be part of what's being prepared here. It's not just like a new cafeteria. It's got to be part cafeteria, part nutrition facility. It's all going to kind of be wrapped up in one if you're doing it right. Yeah. And they're not just normal cooks that, you know, hey, I serve my period over here with the you know, the student bodies. And then I go, my second shift is over here at the football team. No, you're hiring people that specialize in, in preparing plans and making food for athletes. It's a completely different meal plan than what you're going to find at a, even the best um, on-campus facilities. So I, I do think it is important to be able to do that, in my opinion. Sure. Well, another thing for me, Sean, is I, I think that 
obviously we talk about renovating the Goog is sort of a big picture part of it, but two more specific things. One would be noted. I've said this before. This is not new for me. I think Notre Dame needs to be, take a lot more pride in ha- and being trendsetters when it comes to off the field staff for sports, meaning making sure that the strength and conditioning programs are staffed the way that they need to, making sure the nutrition programs are staffed the way they need to, making sure that Notre Dame has a trend setting mental health uh, staff and operation that, that are working with young people. Because if you think about it, Sean, like when you and I first got into this, I mean, these kids had, it was tough for student athletes. I mean, they had to go to school, especially at Notre Dame. They had to go to school. They had to play a, a physical sport. They had to do homework and all that. Now these kids at 17, 18, 19, 20, 21 years old are not only doing that, but they're they're involved in this crazy NIL stuff. You know, they've got agents coming at them as teenagers. I mean, they've got expectations. Like they drop a pass and they're getting death threats on social media which you and I may say, well, just don't read the mentions because you and I spent most of our lives without Twitter. So I don't really <laughs> care what anybody says about me on Twitter. But right. these kids were grown up in that where their opinions sadly are being formed by what people say about them. And, and you know, when I, when I when, as a 45 year I hear somebody say, you know, cyberbullying, well, then just freaking turn it off. But that's just – that Seems simple. It does. <laughs> but for an 18-year-old or a 20-year-old, right. it's like, no, dude, like my, my whole life, that's how I connect to the world, you know, that yeah. way. And so – they're dealing with so much more crap being thrown at them that we need to, I believe, put a lot more emphasis on, hey, we need to make sure these young people are okay. And then that should extend to me to their first couple years, two to three, four years outside of their careers. Because something I've always believed in strongly and as of having gone through this and then also seeing go through it is there are two types of people in our country that have a really hard time post-career. The biggest, obviously, is military. You know, those who serve overseas and those who who have to fight in the wars that we send them to go fight, and then they come back, and we're not doing enough to make sure that they're okay in in, in what they're experiencing. And I think there's a much, much lower level, but a similar level to where you spend your whole life being an athlete, and just like that, your eligibility is gone, and it's over. You know, mm-hmm. having things where we're helping them transition to life after football, life after basketball, life after whatever sport that they're playing. And I just think all of that holistically is very important that um, I think we have a much better understanding of of the impact of of what just the world is throwing at young people compared to what it was when we because we didn't know there was always dangers that exist now existed then. But because we didn't have social media and twelve, you know, twenty-four hour news cycles and all that some stuff, Sean, we were just blissfully ignorant of the fact that there was a pedophile, you know, ten pedophiles within a fifteen-mile radius of wherever your kid's playground is. We didn't right. know that. Now it's like you just pop up an app, like, oh my god, like my and I and I learned about this when we moved to this neighborhood here because my wife would she used to work in a fire department, so she knows all the ways to look and see where are all the criminals living. <laughs> Where are the registered sex offenders living? Okay. Like, holy crap, you can just pull up an app and see that? He's like, yeah. I said, like, well, shoot, I'm glad you're doing that because I had no idea, right? So, uh, but there's just so much being thrown at young people today that you and I can maybe handle because we've been through it, but we need to do more to make sure that they're they're doing well there. Those are things that I think Notre Dame needs to be trendsetters in. Because those are a, those aren't about NIL and sacrificing what you believe. Those are actually at the heart of who you say you are as an institution. And so I think those are things that I, I, I get a lot more investment. And then back to football, the the, uh, the the analysts, GAs, the assistant coaches. Notre Dame. There's no excuse for Notre Dame not to have a top five paid coaching staff. There's no excuse for Notre Dame to ever lose a coach because he's 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 getting paid more somewhere else. Those are more things that I think need to be invested in. And that's true for basketball, football, any any sport that's making money, especially football, that should be true. And um, that's something that I would do if I was uh, talking about top three priorities is making sure that that our football coaches, our head football coach is never going to have to to say, hey, gee, I, I just couldn't put the right staff together because I couldn't afford it and actually have a leg to stand on. That doesn't mean some I – mean, hey, Let's be real, Sean. If, if Brian Kelly had a top five, five pay coaching staff, he'd still be making excuses if he didn't win. There'd right. still be somebody else to blame. Right. That's fine. I'm talking about in reality, practically, that should never be a thing in Notre Dame. So those are things that I would do just right now. I mean, those are those are things you can do quickly that don't involve 
you know, those last two things don't involve me building new buildings and raising $500 million to build this or renovate this or do that. Those are things that you can staff right now and say, we're going to do this right now. These are going to be things over the next year. We're going to make sure that we've invested in, and to make sure our operation is just rocking and rolling in those two areas. I think that would pay huge dividends for student athletes and for the programs, yeah. in my opinion. So those are those are immediate things that I could that I think they should do. Yeah, the coaches' salaries that that would be on my list, and then my my other one would just be, you know, again, not not necessarily using nil from the recruiting thing, you know, which which I know that a lot of people would you know disagree with pay for play or or whatever, but just staying at the four yeah. of of nil and making sure that you have competitive nil in place because it is you're talking about for the current thing. players right sean right right current Agreed. once you're here yeah again Agreed. not not as not as part of recruiting Agreed. but once you're here that there are bountiful nil opportunities right for for notre dame play you know and mm -hmm. and whether it's making it part of the tv contract the apparel country mm -hmm. you know all those different things you know exploring those different avenues agree that should be an area where notre dame is trend setting i think you're right. spot on there sean because this is the reality this is something you as leadership have said you believe in you believe in nil so then you should be supporting this wholeheartedly to say hey, okay if this is a reality of it and we say we believe in this then we're going to be the best at it. this has been my kind of my big problem with notre dame is they 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 do these things? Hey, we're gonna we're gonna do whatever we need to do to make sure as an academic institution and a whatever institution we're gonna do whatever we need to do to make sure we are the best. But then they're not willing to make those same commitments for athletics. Well, you know, uh, Jack Swarbrick can be the second highest paid athletic director in, in all of sports, but we can't have our our football coaches be, you know, second highest paid staff and make that make sense. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And so. It's, it's those investments to me. And the same thing with NIL. Like, this is the reality. You say you support it, then you need to be doing whatever you can to make sure your student athletes are maximizing those opportunities while also understand that they are also students. Uh, I agree with you completely. They should not be, they should do it the right way, but they should be heavily involved because you've got the resources to do it, Sean. I mean, you and I both yeah. know that. The resources Absolutely. are there if they wanted to do it for them to absolutely thrive in it and, and yeah. to do it the right way. I just wish Notre Dame was more, played more of a leadership role. And those things. Hey, if you think this should be done a certain way, then go do it and do it. Set the yeah. example for everyone else. Hey, this is how we need to be treating student athletes from a mental health standpoint. And and well, how do you know that's going to work? Because we're doing it. This is how NIL should be done properly. This is the model that we need to be going to the NCAA and saying, Hey, look what Notre Dame is doing. This is how it should be done. You want to say, Hey, look, you know, we think this, 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 and this. Well, how do you know that'll work? Because Notre Dame's doing it. And look how successful it is. Look how good it is. This kid was a big-time recruit, played great as a freshman. I always point to Justin Ross as my example. If Justin Ross had NIL, he is he is one of the poster child children for why I'm a believer in NIL. Because this kid comes out as a freshman, helps them win a championship, does everything right, and is on pace to be a millionaire. And then he has these devastating injuries and he's never going to make the money as a professional that he would have because of the injuries he sustained while trying to help Clemson win a championship. Yeah. If NIL was a thing that he was able to capitalize on during his career, he's still going to be all right. Yeah. If he never plays it down in football, those are the things that we should be putting a lot of emphasis in. And, and Notre Dame should be the team that the NCAA and these other people go to the Congress and say, that's how it's done. That's how we do student athletes. That's how we, that's the proper method of amateurism right there. That's how amateurism is supposed to, not this bull crap definition of amateurism they've had for years where they just kept all the money and just be happy with your scholarship and shut up, right? I've, right. I've never been a believer in that. I think that's just as stupid as people who say scholarships don't mean anything. Okay, cool. If they don't mean anything, then give these kids salaries, but tell them they have to pay for their own tuition, room and board, and all that kind of stuff as part of their salary. Then tell me that, so that scholarships don't mean anything, right? They're both stupid arguments, right? There is value to it, but that value is, goes here, and you're making way up there that they deserve more of in certain opportunities. And so you want to create a, a real version of amateurism. These kids should not be employees. They should not be uh, susceptible to those type of, of unions and different things like that. Because, But at the same time, the NIL needs to be a real thing. So Notre Dame, show everybody how it's supposed to be done. Be in front of this 
embrace this and show everyone this is the proper model to amateurism. That's what I wish Notre Dame would do. And that sounds like what you're what you're saying they should do yeah. as well, Sean. Is exactly. And, and you know what, Sean? There's no reason they shouldn't be that way. And that's what frustrates me with Notre Dame. What's the reason for them not being that way? They don't want to. What's, exactly. <laughs> it's, it's a great answer. Like I give this 45 minute long diatribe and you come out with three words and it's like, yep, he nailed it. <laughs> I mean, that's what it comes down to. <laughs> it is. It is. And so, and, and some people say, I hate NIL. I love NIL. I think NIL at, at its core is great for college athletes. It's being abused by both sides right now. And neither side it, it cares enough about trying to make it right for everybody. They just want their own thing. And um, that's where Notre Dame needs to be more of, of the trendsetters and the leaders. That's absolutely, I, I nailed that one, Sean. I think that's an absolutely, absolutely great point. Very, very well done. All right, Joe, do either of you think the new athletic director will focus on getting Notre Dame into a conference? What are your thoughts on that, Sean? I, I kind of shared mine earlier. What What do you think? I mean, do you think this is going to be something that Notre Dame prioritizes? Or do you think it's something that Notre Dame will only ever do if it just gets to the point where they ha they literally have no no other option? What are your thoughts on that? For yeah. football, obviously. The latter. I... I, I it, Especially when you look at the fact that you're you're having a handoff from one Notre Dame alum to another Notre Dame alum. But again, the new guy, Peter Babakwa, 1993, Notre Dame graduate who was a walk-on on the football team for Lou Holtz. I, I think that that is a factor in this. And the fact that he's coming over from NBC Sports, and we've, you know, we've talked about that. We've hit that a few different times with the experience that he has there. I, I don't think that that is going to be his focus. I think his focus is going to be, you know, one of his biggest early focuses is going to be this TV contract. And when you look at his TV background, I, I think that that's going to be very important and getting that contract, the, the, the number that they need out of that contract is going to be the foundation that keeps them from needing to join a conference. So I think I, I I think this that Bavakwa's focus is is going to be that. I don't think it's going to be getting Notre Dame to join the Big Ten or any other conference. I, I think that is that it is going to be keeping Notre Dame independent for as long as possible. Yeah, I do. I agree. I think that's their goal. From Brian, what's Jack's next move? Retirement or conference work? What's it going to be? You know, I, I think it's going to be a little bit of both. I, I don't I, – somebody had said something on the message board. They said, you know, I've, I've run into Jack a lot over the years, just bumping into him. And the last couple of times I've seen him, um, he looks tired. And, and I, I think that's true. I I think the stuff that he that he has had to lead Notre Dame through the last 10 years is – is it's taxing. I mean, it's like one of my – one of my funniest things to do is like to look at like presidents at the beginning of their term and when they leave. Like look at Bill Clinton when he was elected and then what right. he looked like when he ended. When you look at Bush, you know, he's still got brown hair, looks young. And then just eight years later, he looks like he's like, you know, <laughs> much older. Obama looks right. young and, you know, black hair. And then by the end, he's like this withered gray haired dude. I mean, it is a taxing profession. This right. isn't like that, but it's the sports equivalent of it. Being the head coach or being the athletic director at Notre Dame, because mm -hmm. you're not just dealing with like, if you're an AD at, at some schools, I mean, you, you worry about money, but you're just, you're setting schedules. You're, you're doing staffs. You're doing, you're doing athletics all the time. This is, and it's just been like one crazy thing after another. You have the academic scandal. You, you have the conference realignment stuff twice. You've got TV deals, apparel deals, uh, COVID, you know, your head coaches, you know, the issues you had with your head football coach and that relationship, how strained that was at the end. You've got, co then COVID comes, right? And there's just all these things. You finally get out of COVID and then boom, the world turns upside down from an athletic standpoint with NIL and the transfer portal and conference realignment. And it's just like all hitting at once. It's like, man, that's got to wear you down. And so I think it's kind of like, I need to take a break for like five minutes, but I also feel like if possible, Jack still going to want to be involved in some of these things that are happening in college sports in some capacity. And I'm curious what kind of role he'll be allowed to have in those if he's not directly linked to an institution. I'm very curious about that. But I still think that deep down, Jack would like to run the NCAA. 
I just, I feel that. I would Is that window that. passed or not? I don't know. Or here's a better one. I would not be shocked. I have zero information of this. This is just me reading the tea leaves and things that I think about Jack. He's He was always very pro NCAA. But in the last six months, Sean, he's made some comments that are, that are kind of like, okay, I think he thinks he knows where this is going. And he wants to position himself maybe to be the guy that runs the new whatever organization that's in charge yeah. of college football. Now that he sees the NCAA president is a, is a, you're basically, it's like, you know, the last emperor of Rome, like, yeah. Okay. Right. You're not leading the same Roman empire that, that you did 300 years ago. Right. Um, you know, maybe he sees it like that and he wants to be in position for this new role. Maybe that's it. Or he could just retire. I mean, the guy doesn't need to do anything else. He's made plenty of money. Yeah. He's in his seventies. Right. I mean, I just say hey, retire you know, and just, you know, do whatever. But I just, but also you don't have the success that you, that he had and be comfortable just doing nothing. And just right off into the sunset. Right. Yeah, right <laughs> I mean, now. Just wait to die. Yeah. I just, you don't get to where Jack Swarbrick has got to by just wanting to sit by the beach until you die. Yeah. You know, I just, you don't get there either. I think something's coming because it, the, you know, they didn't call it a retirement in the release. It just said he'll be stepping down. So yeah. Yeah. But you're, that, that what you were talking about potentially, heading whatever the next organization is that runs college football. That that could be something to keep an eye on. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. It's going to be very interesting. Mm -hmm. All right, let's get to some more here. We've got a lot of good questions here, Sean. From Joe, been hearing a lot over the past year about a new era at Notre Dame. Do you think Marcus Freeman was the catalyst for this, or was it in progress before the hiring of him? Oh, I, I think Marcus Freeman's the catalyst for this. I it, you can't have a new era where the coach has been there 14 years, 15 years, like they would have if Brian <laughs> Kelly was here. I mean, you, you just yeah. can't. You you can try and reinvent yourself all you want. Brian Kelly tried that lasted about a 10 months, you know, and and because you are who you are. So yeah, I think the new era is is, but it's not. You know, it, it's Marcus Freeman is the one that kind of rocketed into the stratosphere, but but I think it actually started with Niall Ivy. Because she was her, that that first the first new blood and and you and I've had I think well I know Vince and I had conversations and I and I think you and Vince were having conversations as well but even before you were working for me when 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 uh, Muffet left I mean we heard tons of rumblings about yeah Kelly's not far behind and Bray's not far behind I mean we've mm -hmm. been hearing that for a few years now and then of course Kelly leaves and then Bray leaves so none of those moves were necessarily shocking I think the timing and the manner in which coaches left were surprising I mean I I didn't expect Kelly to leave when he did. We kind of expected Bray to leave maybe a couple years earlier. Then he has that bounce back season. Like, yeah, maybe I stay down. Then they kind of fall apart. So that wasn't mm -hmm. shocking. But we always, th there was going to be this, a lot of this movement happening quickly. And the coaches that you replaced them with were going to be the de determine what direction you as an institution go. And for the most part, they've made decisions to go with younger coaches that bring a different level of energy. Uh, in personality to the table than what you had. And that's where the new era comes from. So I think Marcus Freeman being the football coach is the biggest driver of that, the face of that in some regard, but it's, it's, it's him. It's Niel, it's Micah Shrewsbury. It's going to be the new AD. You know, the new AD is like probably 50 something. If you know he graduated college, college four years before I graduated high yeah. school and I'm 45. So, I mean, I imagine he's 51, 50, 52. Right? Yeah. But he was a lot younger than Jack Swarbrick. Yeah. Right? He looks a lot younger. So there's just going to be this. Yeah, new I mean, state and he's know. even, he, you know, just a few years, but he's still a little bit younger than Swarbrick was when he took over. Right. And he's, and he's younger than what Brian Kelly was when he left. He's younger than what Mike yeah. Gray was when he left. So, I mean, so you're a lot younger now. I mean, even Micah Shrewsbury at 46 is the old guy of the coaches. Right. And he's my age basically. And where he was younger than Brian Kelly and Mike Bray and, and, and coach McGraw. And so uh, I think those are all facets of it. But at any time, any time you're in a situation, it's the football coach. But there's still plenty of, you know, longtime coaches that are having great success. Kevin Corgan's been here 35 years, and he just won his first title. I mean, lacrosse team's never been any better. I mean, Jeff Jacks has been uh, – part. how long has he been running the hockey team? He's not exactly a spring chicken, yeah. right? But they've had a lot of success in recent seasons. A little bit of a down year this year, but they've had a lot of success. So you know, I think football hopefully can kind of start – and basketball can kind of get on the same page because it feels like when the other sports are thriving, football, you know, is not as good. You know, women's basketball wins back-to-back -back championships, which you're like, yeah, but the football team wasn't that good at the time. They were just kind of starting to kind of get better and stuff. 
you'd like to get it to where can we please get all of you on the same page, please? <laughs> you know, and uh, and then that just makes being a Notre Dame fan a lot more fun. Like, hey, we went to the Final Four in women's basketball. Our men's team went to the Elite Eight. The football team made the playoff. Oh, and we won lacrosse. We won, you know, our soccer team went to the NCAA cha- you know, uh, tournament. That's where you want to be. Men's team or baseball team just went to the World Series last year. That's really where I want to be. But a, a lot of it is if you're not winning in football and men's basketball – it kind of tamps down a lot of the other success that's happening uh, in your sports programs. That's just the reality of it. And so, and I think it helps that those, you know, those three coaches that we've been talking about Freeman Ivy and, and Shrewsbury, you know, not just the fact that they're all young head coaches, but the fact that they're, they're all very focused on recruiting and yes, the right kind of recruiting. And finally being given the resources. I mean, from what yeah. I've heard so far that there, there's an investment in the basketball program that Micah Shrewsbury negotiated for. If you want me to be here, it's not just about paying me a lot of money. It's investing in the recruiting aspect of it. Mm-hmm. And you mentioned, Sean, what is it they got? Uh, to, well, they had to made the one hire that you wrote about, uh, Ryan Owens, who was basically an AAU coach. Right. Then they basically hired their own version of Chad Bowden. Recruiting coordinator, Brian yeah. Snow. Yeah, they, they didn't have a recruiting coordinator previously, and they've got one now. So those are investments that need to be made, and mm-hmm. they will eventually pay off if your foot if your if your coaches are competent, then you're gonna win and they're gonna pay off. And so I think those are all those are all good things. And and sometimes you need fresh blood to do that. You need a coach that that's coming from a different era to be able to to say, hey, look. Yeah, this worked for you 30 years ago, but this isn't 30 years ago. You know, could a yeah. coach like Lou Holtz win today? Yeah, because Lou Holtz is a great coach. He can win in any, any, any era, but you can't win the same way he won at Notre Dame in 1988. Right. You have to evolve, right? He couldn't run the same offense he ran in 1988. He would find some other offense that allows you to play power football and discipline football or whatever, and he'd still win if, if he were younger. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But it's like, but you have to embrace – those other aspects. And I think that's something that's always frustrating. The, the, the traditionalists at Notre Dame, well, you know, we believe in tradition. So we're going to still, you know, have the, the lines in the, the end zone that point Newt Rockney would have been the first dude putting, in my opinion, putting Notre Dame painted Notre Dame in the end zone. He'd have been the first dude to have a scoreboard. If they were, you know what I mean? Like if, if they like the big scoreboard, he'd have been the first guy to have field turf. Right. You know what I mean, like he if they had that house. stuff back then. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and so it frustrates me when you hear like, well, we're we're going to that, that's not how that's not how Notre Dame became Notre Dame. It was we're doing revolutionary offenses. We're doing things that nobody does or nobody's seen before. Right. And Notre Dame lost that along the way at some point. Yeah. In time. They were actually innovators. Yes. And they kind of, but then they fell yes. back into that. Well, this is how we've always yes. done it mode. Yes. Unfortunately. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um. All right. Here's an interesting. Here's an interesting question. Okay. <laughs> All right. So how many people does IB have on the payroll? Basically, how many off-camera people are part of the company? <laughs> um, Off-camera? I mean, it's zero, right? Like, uh, there's like No, I mean, like, I, I pay, you like... your wife. Because well, yeah, I mean, I pay her company. Stuff, but... You know, I, her company does things for us in the back end. Um, but no, I mean, look, if you're going to work for me, you're going to help generate revenue. And, yeah. uh, the way you're doing that is being on shows. That's right. So, yeah, I mean, now are we, now we, Sean, you and I are, you're aware of some things. There are, there are some moves I'm working on to eventually get people that are doing things off air to do production and stuff, but, uh, we're not there yet. If you all, all of you all that watch these shows, we have 14,000 subscribers to our channel. If all of you bought monthly memberships to the message board for four ninety nine a month, you know what? I'd hire three more people, four more people. So, uh, yeah, you guys want to help us grow and hire people on air, off air, and continue to grow? Sign up for the message board because the number of subscribers we have on YouTube is way higher than the number of subscribers we have on our message board. Good point. Yeah. Excellent point. Yes. Come on, so, make something happen. There you go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Here's a question from Jake Callahan. Do you think Notre Dame football will be forced to join a conference in five years? No. No. I, I, I don't think so either. Uh, I'll have a better idea, Jay, when we find out what the deal is for the Pac-12 and the Big 12 and, and see how some of that dust settles. But I just I don't see a scenario where that's going to happen. I, I think things have timed up really well for Notre Dame. 
if Notre Dame's TV deal didn't run up for four years, I think Notre Dame might have been in a tough spot in four years when they're able to renegotiate a new contract. Because there, there'd be, so, I just think there'd be a lot less space for them to be, uh, to be able to find the kind of deal that they're pursuing now, because and, there's so much. There's there hasn't been the money distributed to the Big Twelve yet, and the the Pac Twelve yet. The ACC is not, you know, is not close. The ACC would be a lot closer to their deal getting over in four years. I think the timing of when Notre Dame's two, the pair on the TV deal are expiring, was about as perfect as it can be for Notre Dame, in my opinion. Because they now know what the Big Ten is getting, they now know what the SEC is getting, they now know what they need to, what their worth is, and what they need to be. So, I think the timing of when this TV deal is ending was is just going to be a, 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 I mean, I don't know the word to use, Sean, but it's like, boy, it's a, it's a blessing that it's happening when it's happening. If it was three years sooner or three years too later, I, I don't know if you have the same position to to get the money that you're going to get now which is going to help you to what you've said multiple times. That's what helps you stay independent is we got a TV deal. That's going to double or triple what we were making before. Right. And we were pretty good football programs before. Now we've tripled our revenue. Well, now we're really, you know, now, now we're cooking with grease now, baby. Right. <laughs> and that's, um, and, and that's a, that's, that's kind of where I, why I think that's that right there. That, that is the reason I don't see them joining the conference in the next yeah. five years. And I just think, you know, even though you've got all this smoke blowing around with the ACC, if if they could, if if any of those schools could get out of that grant of rights that the ACC has, they would have done it by now. Yes, I just don't think that there's a way for any of these schools to do it that's not going to cost them probably around three hundred million dollars right now to do it. You know, like the question was five years, and the grant of rights runs through twenty thirty six, so they've got thirteen more years. You know. When we get closer to 2030 and the and the buyout is a little bit less, then then maybe sure. something happens. But I just think that, you know, as much as they all want out of it, I, I just don't think that there's a way for them to get out of it. Otherwise, one of them would have done it at this point already. Because like Florida State wants out because right. as an institution, forget athletics, they're hurting for money. Mm-hmm. And they don't have the donors that some of the other big schools have. And that's something that Jimbo complained about. Now, they're not exactly poor, but they don't have the kind of money that other places do. The, the Going to the SEC would be incredibly beneficial to them. That's why they want to do it. It's the only reason they want to do it. It has nothing to do with sports. Like People say, well, a buddy might say, I just don't understand why Texas and Oklahoma going to the SEC. And it doesn't make sense. I'm like, dude, you keep trying to have sports arguments with me about why they're going. Right. It has nothing to do with sports, man. It's for one reason and yeah. one reason only. Money. That's it. Yep. It has nothing why? to do with the ability yeah. to win championships. It's silly it's for the, you know, d- d- Does USC and UCLA not know how this, the, how hard it's going to be for their other sports to try? I'm like, yeah, they know. They don't care. It's about money. Mm-hmm. And, and if the Pac-12 was paying anything close to the Big Ten, they would not be even thinking about leaving for the Big Ten. It's about money. But the problem for Florida State is, Sean, they don't have the money to get to pay to get out of that deal. And it's not going to be a big enough contract going to the SEC to help them do that. They, they don't have the money to buy out of that deal. If those right. schools had the money to buy out of those deals, then A, they may not need the new deal as much, <laughs> and B, they would have done it already. Yeah. But that's the whole point. They don't have the money to do that. Yep. And uh, – I'm I'm very curious how this whole thing is going to play out because I, I really think at some point in time we're going to find out whether whether it comes through discovery during ESPN being bought by someone else because because Disney's trying to sell ESPN. I have a feeling something's going to come out someday that's going to show that it was the it was ESPN people that were behind the scenes trying to push these ACC teams out of the league because they want to get out from underneath that deal. I wouldn't doubt it. I wouldn't and they want because it it's it's if they can take half that money and give it to the SEC, then they're in a better financial position because ESPN's in a not as good of a financial position as people think, and and that's 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 just the reality. That's why they that's why the Big Ten is now with NBC and CBS also because ESPN can't afford to do that all by themselves. Yeah, uh, nor can Fox. That's that's just the reality of it because there's not the money in it that people think anymore because the whole the whole television deal is completely changing. It's not the big networks anymore, and you know, and and you know, Disney's what six, seven billion in the hole. Yeah, you know, less profit in the last year than they were before. 
they want out of that deal. The streaming revenue, they because here's the thing. Jack Swarbrick has really been into streaming. And that's why he's been pushing the Peacock thing. Like people were pissed at NBC. Like why would, you know, why would, um, you know, NBC uh, or why would, you know, it's stupid that NBC wants to do this game on Peacock only. Like guys, that was not NBC's idea. That was Jack's idea because Jack Swarbrick thought that streaming was where this was all going to go. Well, now the streaming networks are having their issues. They're not as successful as they thought. Disney's having issues with streaming. Netflix is losing customers. I mean, uh, these, these streaming networks aren't, taking off as quickly as people thought. And they're not as, you know, uh, I know that like for me, I, I get sick of the streaming because it's like I paid to get away from that. Cause I didn't want to have to deal with nonstop commercials, but at least when I had Comcast or dish or whatever, I could fast forward the commercials. Right now I freaking can't. And they happen at the most more random times. Yeah. yeah. It's like the most, the weirdest times where, you know, something's on TV, you're, you're, you're spacing and creating it to where there's somewhat smooth transitions and now it's like a guy's in the middle of a conversation, a ad pops up. And, and then there's some other reasons that have to do with why they're hurting financially that, that are just not appropriate for this show. Uh, but the fact is, is that they're not in the healthy place they were when they started handing out these big deals a decade ago. Yeah. And I think that that's why they're trying to get out from underneath some of these deals. And I think ESPN, if, if, if there's ever a discovery period, whether it be through an acquisition of ESPN or – the ACC just gets sick of ESPN's meddling and they just say, we're going to sue you because you're, 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 you're trying to breach the contract or something along those lines. And there's a discovery period. It could get ugly for ESPN. It could get really ugly for ESPN. In my opinion. Surprised. Wouldn't be surprised. So yeah, that, uh, I, I, I'm not going to lie, Sean, I wouldn't have a huge problem with it. I would, (laughs) I would champion it. Let's go nail them, get them, get them. Get them. I, I'm going to ask this one, Sean, because I want to get your okay. opinion on this. This is from Josh Buffo, the motivational business banker. What is your prediction for the apparel and TV network? I think apparel, they're going to end up with one of the Nike brands, you know, whether it's Jumpman or or regular Nike. I, I just I, I think that that is the way it's going unless Under Armour, you know, comes in with some 11th hour miracle and is able to keep it you know they obviously look like they kind of wind and dine marcus freeman a couple of weeks ago when he went out there to the the headquarters and all that kind of stuff but it just feels like it's probably going to be nike because i don't think that they would jump you know back to adidas at this point and all the kids love the nike stuff so it it seems because we're not educating our children well enough about (laughs) how these products are made and where and by whom you know, yeah, so that's, um, that's true too. Yeah. You know, unfortunately TV, yeah. I just, it just feels like it's probably going to end up being NBC because mm-hmm. it's been there for three decades now at this point. And again, I don't, I'm not reading into the chair of NBC sports is coming in and therefore that, you know, means it's automatically yeah. Yeah. going to, to, to end up there. But the relationship has been long. And so unless someone come, you know, someone else comes in with a much bigger truckload of money, I, th- I think that it, it yeah. probably ends up staying on NBC. I'm, I'm curious to see what no, like Notre Dame brought up something very interesting about the shoes thing. And I'm very curious to see, but like, that's the kind of stuff I want to see from Notre Dame, right? Like, well, nobody else does a thing where you have an apparel deal and then a shoe deal. That's kind of fascinating. And that's one of those things when I say I want to see Notre Dame be trendsetters. I would like to see Notre Dame be trendsetters. And that's the other that's thing, too. Point. Yeah. I'd like for Notre Dame to say you're a Catholic institution that, that only only advocates for Catholic things that you believe in in certain situations when it's not money related. So how can you be a Catholic institution that says, hey, we're a Catholic institution and then go team with Nike or team with Adidas for an apparel deal and just ignore how those products are made because it's not happening in your country? Right. And and so uh, that's some of the hypocrisy that I just find um, uh, relatively disgusting. It would be interesting. Yeah, I think what you were kind of alluding to there is if you signed an apparel deal with whatever yeah. apparel company. But again, going back to the NIL thing, you let the players potentially sign their own shoe contracts where right. they could wear, you know, with whatever right. shoe company they wanted. Like whatever apparel you sign with would still be kind of the default, like for for players who don't have their own NIL right, they, they still have still to provide wear. cleats for players, right? Right. But, right, right. But you leave open the option 
where the players could sign their own shoe yeah. shoe deals with because I'll, I'll be honest with you i'd be all for going back to under armor if if i hadn't heard so many bad things about their cleats yes i mean that's that's a you know so like maybe you sign an apparel and it's not deal just with cleats them. it's basketball shoes as well footwear how about do that yeah, footwear. exactly exactly and and so hey let's uh sign an, a clothing deal with you but we're going to sign a shoe deal with so and so yeah but then part of that shoe deal is if our own if, our, if individual players want to sign with someone else they can just like it used to yeah. be you know, before they were full fledged with Adidas, you remember they still wore champion. You know, the right. football team wore champion jerseys, Correct. but they were wearing Adidas footwear. Correct. Yeah. So that would be something, and that now, now that that could be a thing where you know you don't have to go with one of the big boys because Nike's not going to be okay with you saying, "Well, kids can." I mean, they made Michael Jordan put a USA flag over his Reebok sign <laughs> on his freaking right. you know. You, you remember that nonsense on the dream team? Uh -huh. You think they're going to let kids, you know, if they have an apparel deal in their day, you think they're going to let kids wear Adidas or Reebok or Fila or Under Armour or whatever else they want to wear if they have some deal? No way they're, they're going to do that. No way they'll yeah. do that. And so maybe that'll be the thing that ultimately kills that deal. And, and you at, and Under, Under Armour will say, look, we'll go with it. Because if, it, if it's Under Armour, it's actually, you're kind of smart because you don't have to pay as much, you know what I mean, to Notre Dame if you're not guaranteeing that you're going to always wear our shoes, you know? So, so we'll, we'll have the certain deal with you. And for Notre Dame, it's smart because if you can sign two contracts is going to get you more than one, mm -hmm. you know, cause you're going to get a little bit more on the apparel than you would have. But for Under Armour it makes sense. Cause now we don't necessarily have to provide shoes. We're still with Notre Dame. We're still, you know, when people rock Notre Dame gear around campus and stuff, you buy it's all still going to be Under Armour. And so, but you so they don't have to pay as much, but they're it's going to be more than Notre Dame, and then Notre Dame's going to get more from the another company just for shoes, you know. And, and and so, I mean, I think that would also make a lot of business sense too, Sean. I mean, that's for sure. You know, like like it's like if I'm going to hire two people to do one job, and I say, well, I would pay one person fifty. Well, the odds of me paying two people twenty five are slim. I'm going to have to probably pay two people forty. You know what I mean? And that's just kind of right. how it goes. And it's the same thing on the reverse here. Uh, for Notre Dame, so I think that would make a lot of a lot of sense because right. I love Under Armour's clothes. I, I do mean, too. I've got an Under Armour shirt on right now. Yeah. I own a ton of I Under do. Armour shirts. You know, it's just the uh, it's just the shoes. Yeah, and <laughs> my wife's not a big fan. She bought a pair of like Notre Dame colored Under Armour shoes, and she didn't wear them very all very much. Yep. So yeah. All right. So good questions. Very good questions. Um, here we go. Here's one little little different topic. There we go. All right. From James, what are you looking forward to over the next few weeks of recruiting? Finishing. I mean, that's the big <laughs> thing for me is finishing. I mean, look, you've got, you know, I wrote an air, an article about this at the beginning of, of um, the month, you know, kind of end of May where, you know, this month is going to define how good this class is going to be. And you had some important visitors this first weekend. Obviously, Gearby Lambert was an important visitor. Kedron Young was an important visitor. Bronte Johnson's an important visitor. Dave, Davis Andrews is an important visitor. But I mean, coming up, you've got you've got Elijah Rushing, you've got Kingston Villiama Asa, you've got some very important players coming on campus. Carter Nelson coming on campus this weekend. You know, if you're going to have any shot at, at landing Elijah Rushing, you got to knock it out of the park the next few days. I mean, you got to absolutely just just dominate it so far. The good news for Notre Dame is the last two summers since Mar Marcus Freeman's become the head coach, June has been their money month. I mean, they have been – Notre Dame does a great job with official with visits. I mean, I don't know what it exactly it is they do, but, man, kids just constantly leave Notre Dame in love with the place, constantly. And you're like, you know, they're actually a player for this kid that I thought they had no shot at. And sometimes they don't even get the kid, Sean, but you're like, they had no shot at this kid before, and now – they finish a close second, right? So you, you, this is the movement. These next two weeks are movement weeks. So, so what I'm looking forward to is what is the vibe coming out of Kingston Villiam Asa the next couple of weeks when he's visiting USC this weekend, then Notre Dame, then Ohio State. You know, how far can you put yourself ahead of Ohio State going on last visit? Can you know what kind of movement can you make with Elijah Rushing? How much movement can you make with Carter Nelson? A lot of people are thinking is leaning towards Georgia now. Nebraska's still a player there. You know, can you knock you know the, your three three days with him out of the park to the point where you can get him? That's what this next few weeks are going to be about. And you know, who can you close with? I mean, because they're at 19 right now. And uh one of the questions that we had in the chat, Sean, was 
about um, do I still think that Notre Dame, here we go, from uh, SH10 for Heisman, do you still think Notre Dame is not done with uh, this week with commitments? I don't think they're done. And so, uh, but now it's like, okay, that's great, but can you can you have the success in week two and week three that you had in week one? That's going to be the question. So, man, it, it's sure. it's closing time, Sean, right? I mean, and so the, the, that that's what you get paid for, right? It's not, yeah. hey, we, we finished second a lot. <laughs> We're great. At, no, it's finished first. It's exactly right. Yeah. I, I've, yeah. you know. I've I've finished second for uh you know jobs in the past and it does yeah. you absolutely no, no good when you finish second you know nope it's, nope it's still the first loser so yep not not for this job though no that's so, right that's Did right not finish yeah. second that's right no <laughs> you were you fin- I mean technically um I mean you were every place you were the only person that I was considering so uh yeah I was like I got to get that guy over here man first so, second and third that's, that's right. right that's right it's like one of my mom week, says by to the me, way next week is the first is the one year anniversary yeah. of the first show that yeah I did. that's awesome I didn't I knew it was coming up sometime this summer but yeah it's yeah. awesome hopefully it's we been did. a fun enjoyable year for you if you remember we did it, absolutely it has we did the first <laughs> show the day after Notre Dame beat Tennessee that's right. to go to the College World Series that's right. So there's a lot happening when you first got started. <laughs> right. We had fun. <laughs> there's a lot Still happening. Fun. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm glad. I'm very glad. It's like when my mom says to me, you're my favorite son. And I'm like, yeah, that doesn't mean as much to me as you think it does. Cause I'm your Still only, the son. only son. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Josh, the Josh Buffo, the motivational business banker, does USC joining the big 10 play any factor if the decision needs to be made for Notre Dame to join a conference, NBC getting Big Ten and the connection, NBC and the AD have thoughts on this. I think it does, actually. I think that, that that's about the only thing that's happened in the Big Ten in the last couple of years that I think actually moves the needle even a little bit for Notre Dame to join the Big Ten. I think that's the only thing as far yeah. as what the Big Ten has done now. There may be other things that happen externally that then force Notre Dame to the Big Ten, but it's not because of what the Big Ten has done. It's because of other movement in college football. This new league starts. You have to be in one of two leagues if you want to be eligible for the postseason. That's what Notre Dame has always said. The, the only way we would join a league is if, you know, financially just it, it, we just can't afford to not be in a league, which if this new deal is what it's going to be, then that's not an issue at all. And then the second one is, is we can't play for a championship in football. So if there's this new deal where there is no more NCAA and it's, you know, it's it's uh, this this new entity that's running college football and they say, hey, look, you've got to be in a league to win a chance to, to play for you know the, the postseason, then Notre Dame would have no choice. I don't see that happening anytime soon. But the so so that would be external forces, not Big Ten forces. There's nothing the Big Ten can or can do to to force Notre Dame's hand. They've trust me, they've tried. They've tried plenty of times. Mm-hmm. I think the only thing that they've done that even remotely might play in their favor is getting USC in the Big Ten. Because now your rival is in the league. You could join the league, conference. And yeah. it's now a conference game, not a non-conference game, which would then lead Notre Dame to be able to say, look, if they join the Big Ten and you got to play nine conference games, well, USC's now, that's our rival that we play every year. That's part of the negotiation, which means you still now have three non-conference games to work with. So you can right. still have Navy and then still have two more to work with. I think that would be the only positive for joining the Big Ten. Yeah. And that's a that's a small movement for me. I'd rather stop playing USC than join the Big Ten. If it can't, like if USC and the Big Ten tried to say, "Hey, you know, USC is not going to be able to play you consistently anymore if you don't join the Big Ten because of whatever reason," I'd say, "Well, it's been fun. Appreciate <laughs> it, right? Y'all, good luck in the Big Ten. Right? We're going to go ahead and schedule somebody else. Right? I think that's what I think Notre Dame would do right now. Um, and and the Big Ten. The Big Ten fans and and Big Ten people like Jim what was the previous Jim Delaney used to mm-hmm. think he could like boss Notre Dame around and he'd always kind of and it just it come like oh no they don't really care what you think you know and um, I think with this new deal being being uh, coming around at the time that it is and if they're able to get what we think they're going to get th- they've lost all their leverage from a from a financial standpoint it's now just about if somehow Notre Dame can't play for a championship. That's it. And I just don't see that happening anytime soon. I, yeah. I, and I mean, they've already got the inclusion in the 12 team playoff, you know, so that's, yeah. that's taken care of. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. All right. 
University of Southern Clown Town asks, Love what that. what is one thing you guys would add to Notre Dame Stadium for the future? Ooh, man. For me, it's easy. I want I want end zones that say Irish or Notre Dame. I would get rid of the the, the lines. I understand yeah. the slashes are traditional, et cetera, et cetera, whatever. Don't care. That's not a tradition that I find integral. Like I, I can't enjoy Notre Dame games anymore because they have sl- they don't have slashes on the home field, right? Uh, I think having I think having end zones that would uh, I just think it would it would make for a, a more visually pleasing atmosphere. That's just something for me that I that I would absolutely absolutely do. That's the first thing for me, Sean. I would uh, probably just add seat backs, you know, rather than bleachers, since. They're always so hell bent on making sure that you stay in your seats, you know, when you're when you're in the game. Yeah. So you might as well be more comfortable sitting well, in your seat if they're if they don't want you standing up. And if you're going to move to uh, seats, you're going to have fewer people in the stadium. And yeah, and that's. But I, I mean, think, I, I was thinking about that. But I don't think Notre Dame right. cares about that. If they had to lose yeah. ten thousand people in the stands, I don't think they'd care because I mean, the seats would then become more valuable. Just charge I just, a little more. Yeah. Right, because make it – it used to be where you had to stuff, stuff as many people in your stadium as possible because that was a big gener- – Sean Davis and I talked about this. It used to matter how many people were in your stands because that was that was a huge generator of your revenue. Mm-hmm. That changed when these TV deals started getting crazy. Yeah. Because now it's like, whatever, we don't care. That's like well, spending – you know, money. that's like – Look at the NFL money. with this decision to, to, to flex late – you know, December games – to Thursday night, you know, they're, they're, they're going to allow flexing of, of a Sunday game yeah. to Thursday. And it's because they don't care about the people who have made Correct. arrangements to go to a game. It's about the TV contract and the money that they're getting from TV. That's absolutely yep. right. Yep. Absolutely. And, uh, and, and college football is no different. They're not yeah. Notre Dame does not care if on September 23rd, that stadium is all scarlet and gray because you know what they're going to be thinking about. They're going to be counting the dollars that they're making from what they're from what they're it's making exactly yeah. and they're charging you know for this and that and the other thing that's what they're going to care about and they don't care about that because they don't care as much about fans as they used to and as much as they should and eventually mm-hmm. it's i think it's going to bite them in the butt a lot of these a lot of these we we've learned with certain other companies that there are lines you can cross that eventually people say screw you i'm done mm-hmm. major league baseball has learned that to a degree in in the last 30 years and uh, i hope college football eventually realizes you know there this is a very loyal fan base but even your loyal fan base has limits right to where we're just like just i'm done with it i'm over it you know and uh hopefully they don't get to that point but uh yeah so i I think losing ten thousand capacity per game to have seats i don't think would phase them one bit if they felt that that's was going to make allow them to sell tickets for a lot more because in two seasons, it pays for itself, right? Yeah, I mean, exactly. You know, so yeah, good point, Sean. Uh, w- is there another one? Like, you know, he asked for one. But is there anything else that you, when you look at, man, I really wish it had this? You know, I, I've thought about the, the you know, putting Notre Dame in the end zones before as well. And I mean, they've already got the, you know, the Jumbotron or whatever you want to call it. There's really not a whole lot more that I would do mm-hmm. at this point. Because, you know, I know that the, the you know, the video thing was controversial for a long time, but I think it's yeah. worked out great. I think yeah. it's it's really added to the environment over there. I think sometimes it drowns out the band, which I don't like. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I still like bands to be part of it. Another thing I would like, I think it'd be cool to have a little bit more pomp and circumstance for home games. That, that's something I'd like to see. I, I For like intros and stuff. Like you see, I mean, they the fireworks and like the just coming. I, they're, they're, I wish there was a little bit more of that for Notre yeah. Dame games, but that's a that's a sideshow part of it. It's not integral. Like it's not keeping them from man. Notre Dame would, would be able to win national titles if they would shoot more fireworks off before. A game. But you know they, they figured it out for the night games. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. They, yeah. they figured no it doubt. out. They get the night no games doubt. and all those recruits in there. Yeah. So, uh, I, but you know that's that's a minor aesthetic cool thing that has nothing to do with the outcome of the game, in my opinion. I mean, yeah. Oklahoma did as much pomp and circumstance before that 2012 game as I've ever seen. And look what happened. Yeah. <laughs> you know That's what I mean? Right. So <laughs> it really doesn't Enter matter. Enter Sandman, Virginia Tech. <laughs> you know, okay. Like, you know, that was so cool. We have to hear about that. Yeah. Now we're about to beat your brains. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. yeah. All right. Here's um, 
here here's one. This is from Michael Johnson. What are the chances Notre Dame switches Fox to Fox or CBS, in your opinion? I mean, if the bid comes in right, yeah, I could see it happening. I, and that's that's still kind of the X factor in this is is there going to be a second serious, you know, bidding partner in this whole thing? Right. Is is someone going to come in? But the other part of that still is also going to be, you know, I, I wonder, you know. Let's say Fox or CBS, just using them because there aren't that many other, you know, potential suitors out there. Let's say that they're going to offer ten or fifteen million dollars more, but they want more control or, or total control of like they're going to make you kick off at noon for home games, for example, things like that. They're going to dictate those game times yeah. more. Would you be willing? Would you be willing to give up control of that for? another 10 or 15 million bucks. Like how much is that? Yeah. How much of a factor is that going to be? Well, and as we're finding out, Sean, that some of those things matter a lot to these schools in the big 10. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's, that's the big pushback is like, All no, we don't want to be playing night games friends. in November. Yeah. It's like shocker. You just signed a contract that, that with, you know, like the whole thing is about having prime time, right? <laughs> big 10 conference games. Shocker. You're going to have to play some of those in November where it's cold outside. Right. I, just, I don't Right. Yeah. I mean, it is kind of funny. So <laughs> it's kind of like, I mean, we see this all the time, right, Sean? I mean, we, we see this and uh, I mean, you know, what, what is, we had one politician say, we got to, you got to pass the bill, but be, you know, so we can find out what's in it. Right. So, I mean, if we're having that happen yeah. at Congress and then why would we be surprised that, that these schools don't exactly know everything that's in a TV deal because they were so enamored with the bottom line. It's like, well, hey, yeah, this is works for us. Look at the number. Uh-huh. Like, Hold on a second. This doesn't work for us. You know, the, the people that actually have to, I don't know, play the freaking games, you know. So I'm actually glad with the, to hear the coaches and, and, and stuff pushing back on that. I I, I, I like that. I hope that that uh, – yeah, Kevin Warren. I mean, <laughs> that freaking guy. I know. Unbelievable. Oh, Mark, thank you for the super chat, by the way. Mark, I got a notion – that the football team has a good chance this year. Your thoughts? Well, this is that season for optimism, right, Sean? I mean, this is this is like you have some people say, well, you know, I can't get too excited because of this. And I'm like, look, it may not work out, but like if but if it doesn't work out, then you're gonna be miserable. So at least have some joy now. You know what I mean? And and don't convince yourself it's gonna suck or it's gonna be bad, and then you never have any joy. This is what the offseason is supposed to be about. It's that eternal optimism. I do think this team has a chance to be really good. There's a lot of questions. There's a lot of, they've got a lot to prove. Uh, they still have to show that they can beat a team like Ohio state, something they haven't done in a long time. The defense has to you know, get better. The offense, you know, has all, all the pieces in place, but I don't know what a Jared Parker offense is going to look like. I have some ideas of what I think they think it's going to look like, but we don't know until we see it. You know, we, I think the offensive line could be pretty good, but there's a couple big question marks there. Are there going to, you know, are there going to be any devastating injuries? I mean, there's so many questions. You say, Hey, look, I don't know if they can beat this team, but then that team has three devastating injuries during the season. that makes them more beatable. There's always so much can happen, but I'll just say this. Do I think, do do I have, am I predicting they're in to win a national championship right now? The fan side of me says, yes. The analyst side of me says, no, because I'm a believer that you're the champ until somebody beats you. And until somebody beats Georgia, they're the they're the favorite to win, right? I mean, they've yeah. lost one game in two years. Do I think this Notre Dame team has a much better chance of playing with those teams than they've had in, in a number of years? Absolutely. Now they just got to go prove it. And that's yeah. pretty much where I'm at with this team, Sean. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I agree with all that. You know, I, I think depth could be the biggest thing with this team if you, if you were to sustain – Injury, you know, like I saw somebody just say, as long as Hartman doesn't get injured, you know, if you're in a situation like you were in last year where you where you lose the starter in the second game of the season, then, you know, that could be could definitely swing things in a hurry. And, you know, you're still even though we know that this wide receiver core is talented and we have pretty high expectations of them, you, you are still counting on, you know, a relatively young, you know, a young and talented group of, of inexperienced guys. You know, mm-hmm. we, we know what their potential is, but we've still got to see it. I do think that Hartman can bring yeah. it out of them. So. And, and youth for me, Sean, is not something that concerns me much at receiver and running back. It just doesn't. Youth yeah. in and of itself 
Right. I mean, you look at teams that have won championships. They've had very young receiving cores in, in certain years. Uh, LSU, Clemson had a sophomore quarterback, sophomore receiver, freshman receiver, sophomore receiver as their four best players. But they were really, really good players, you know. And that's the thing this group has to have. I'm not so much concerned about the youth. I think the part you nailed is they have to prove it. The talent's there. I'm not right. worried about the youth. They're not as young as they were last year. I mean, Jaden and Dion are juniors now. Tobias is a sophomore. Tyree's a senior. You know, they're going to have some experience, but they haven't proven that when they play on September 23rd against the Buckeyes and there's two minutes left and you're down by six and you need a touchdown to win it, they haven't proven it right now that those guys are are, are the type of money players. They step up and, I got this. Don't worry about it. Just get me the ball. I'm going to go mm -hmm. make this play. And they they got to prove that. But the other part of that too is the thing that you, you, you look at it from a Notre Dame standpoint and say, yes, those are question marks. Who's going to be the pass rusher to replace I have say a Foskey who's going to step. But then you say, well, but Ohio state has to figure out how the heck they're going to replace CJ Stroud. They have to figure out how they're going to replace, you know, three really good starters on the offensive line. Then that's kind of where some of my optimism comes from too, Sean, is because a lot of those other teams have questions that are just as big, if not bigger than Notre Dame. I mean, who's the right. star wide receiver that George has had the last two years? Lad McConkey, Jermaine Burton. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's because they were great in other places. Uh, I don't think Notre Dame is as good enough to, to win with that type of receiving core, which means there's going to be a little bit more pressure on their receivers to win. But I also don't think they need to be 2019 LSU either. And so how good are they going to be? But you know, Bama's got big question marks. Ohio State has big question marks. Georgia has big question marks. Clemson has big question marks. Uh, Michigan doesn't have as many question marks, but 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 that's still some. I mean, you know, and so I, I look at it and say that's part of my optimism is Notre Dame is not the only team with these questions. <laughs> right. And I also think we learned a lot about Marcus Freeman in the last seven games of last year that also we know more about him now than we did a year ago True. at this time. And he's now more prepared to handle the prep for a, a Duke, an NC State, a Louisville, a Pitt, where it might be those trap games that like, like we saw last year to where he knows how to get his team on more of a steady – a steady emotional plane. So it's not at, like you don't want to be like tamp it down like Kelly did, but you also don't want it being this right from week exactly. to week. And I think kind of getting it here is the thing that he was trying to find last year where we don't lose our emotion. We don't lose our fire, but our mental focus stays the same. And, and, uh, and, and that's, that's an important piece of this. And I think he's learning how better to get that out of his team. It's like one change is, you know, last year it was like every week there was this new theme for the game. And and um, I can't remember who told me this. I, I can't remember who told me this, but it was basically he was talking to some of the captains. Like one of the things that we did after Stanford was, it just became a, the same theme week week after week. It was like we didn't change it. It was like this is what we do. This is who we are. Lesson learned. Well, now that lesson is going to benefit them this year, where it, it hurt them a little bit last year because it sounded like a good idea. Then you got and do it, and this is part of the learning process as a coach, right? And some former head coach, I said, yeah, I, I could have told you that one going to work. Well, how do you know that one going to work? Because I tried that in my second year <laughs> and, and, and we got our butts kicked. Right. And that's, you know, you don't know what you don't know till you, till you experience it and realize you didn't know it. And then now you do. And that's another reason why I'm, I'm uh, I mean, I don't expect him to be a 10 year grizzled vet now, but he's going to be better than he was last year. And he's going to have a coach that I think there's a greater faith in him. And he has faith in them than what he did last year as well. Coaching staff. I think that should help as well. But uh, mm -hmm. now it's prove it time, right? Yep. Joe, trying to find out as much as I can about this Pete Bavacqua. I'm sure he has negotiated huge deals, but what about when it comes to hiring coaches? Has he ever done anything in that vein? No, I mean, he's hired people to to run different aspects of his organizations, but it's a completely different animal than uh, a, a coaching, right? right? I mean, and so we don't know that. And, and to me, it's it's the hiring part's not as hard as the firing part honestly, for me. And, and uh, I know some people may think that's weird, but I think you can hiring a coach. It's like, did it really, was it really that difficult to look at Niall Ivy as the, the ideal candidate for the women's basketball team? Right. I mean, right. she's an alum. She's coaching the freaking NBA. She was an assistant on the national championship team and then a runner up team. She won a national championship player. Like this is kind of a no brainer. The, the question would be, you know, if, if there isn't a level of success, do you know how to get out of that at the right time? I think those often, it, 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 this is one of the, my beasts of Brian Kelly. 
I, I didn't know. I wasn't upset that Brian Kelly hired Brian Van Gorder. Nick Saban's been made equally bad hires. We're close, not equally bad, but close. Uh, Urban Myers made some bad hires like that. The difference is, is those guys got out of those hires in like a year, right. you know, and, and you know, he, he, Urban Meyer for all his genius as a coach anyway, decided he, he can have Tim Beck and Ned Warner running his offense. Well, then when they got by, beat 31 to nothing in the playoff, he was like, yep, that's not going to work. He got rid of him and brought in, uh, uh, I forget who he brought in after that Kevin Wilson. Right. And then eventually Ryan day, he didn't go three years until it was a complete train wreck to get out of those hires. So it wasn't the hiring process that Brian, I mean, Brian Kelly made a lot more good hires than he made bad hires. A lot more defensive coordinator, offensive line. The problem was he wouldn't get out of the bad hires. Yeah. Wouldn't cut bait when it was time. Would and that was the biggest on the wall. Yeah. And I think that's, that's the more challenging thing for me uh, to, to as a, as a, 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 a leader of an institution like this is it's not so much. And it's the same thing in business, Sean. I mean, Hey, I got this guy and he's not producing. Well, how long are you going to stick with this? You know, before you say we got to do something and the, and the great ones can anticipate, Hey, I'm going to stick with this because there's certain things that are really sound. And I know if I just stick with this for another year, we're going to really flourish. And and you need to be smart enough to be able to, to know that, but you also need to be able to smart enough. Like, Hey, look, not only are we losing money, but, the fundamentals are bad. The, 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 the culture is bad. There, there, nobody's on the same page. There's no leadership. We got to go now. Whereas, Hey, look, this is a well-oiled machine. It's just going to take them some time to get you know, everything going and, and they're, they're going to be fine. The great leaders are the ones can identify which one of those are true and cut bait when you need to cut bait. Cause you know, it's just not going to work, but be willing to see through a rough season of a coach. And I think that's kind of was Jack Swarbrick's thought on Brian of not firing Brian Kelly. Like, look, last year was a, a, a disaster. He's got to make some changes, but this is still the same guy that led us to a title game three years ago. And who was this? And I don't know that there's somebody out there better on the market right now than him. So I'm going to mm-hmm. see this through, but make sure that there's changes or whatever. And it worked out, right? It, it ended up working out. And then there's other people that, you know, fire a coach and, and too early. And then they say like, Clemson could have easily made the decision to fire Dabo Sweeney after they lost 70 to 70, 33 in the orange bowl. I mean, they were kind of struggling. They had a couple bad years and it's an embarrassing loss, but they said, Hey, we like some of the things he's doing. We're going to let him make some coaching changes and see this thing through. And lo and behold, two, three years later, you know, they're playing for a championship and four years later, they're winning their first championships in 1981. Right. Right. And so that's, that's what good leadership does knowing when to cut bait, but also knowing when to see it through and that's something that, that Joe, when it comes to this, I have no idea how he's going to handle that because doing that in business is a lot easier. You can look at it. The internals are this. We got to We got to make a yeah, decision. You can see a definite bottom line yeah. in many cases. Yeah. yeah. This is that's a right. little bit harder. It requires more evaluation of people mm-hmm. and, and than it does in, in business. And so I, I, that's an unknown. I, I have no idea how that's going to go, yep. but um Hopefully we don't have to find out anytime soon. Yeah. <laughs> I hope everything is just rocking and rolling and we don't have to find out. Uh, but uh, but that's the other thing too, Joe. He's not going to have to make any of those big moves, hopefully, anytime soon. And, and you know, because I, I don't see Niel like being gone anytime soon. I, I don't see Michael Shrewsbury leaving anytime soon. And I don't see Marcus Freeman necessarily leaving anytime soon, right? So hopefully, and if one of those coaches leaves, it's most likely because they had a ton of success. And and it's a lot easier to make a hire when you've got this great product to sell than it is when, well, this coach ran this into the ground and you know, now we got to go find somebody. So mm-hmm. hopefully, you won't have to make a decision like that anytime soon. Fingers crossed. Yeah. All right. Um, here we go. This is from Mark. He says you're explaining things is why I super chat. Plus, I'm South Bend boy, South Bend, Washington. <laughs> thank, thank you for that, Mark. I appreciate that thank very, you, very much. Very very much. And hopefully, the answer was. Uh, one that gave you some excitement about what this season is going to be. <laughs> Joel, choose your own Faustian bargain. Notre Dame gets Ooh. 100 million per year, remains independent, but it's with ESPN, or Notre Dame gets 85 million or whatever each team gets per year, but they have to join the Big Ten. That's an easy one for me. I'm taking the 100 million and being on ESPN, whatever. I mean, I hate ESPN, but what's the one thing we've always said? They put on a uh, they they put on a good football product. I mean, they they ESPN broadcasts are pretty good. It's the other not stuff that I don't like. It's Sports Center. It's the other stupid shows. It's the talk. It, 
That stuff I don't like. It's their politics. Not that I dislike their politics. I do. But it's I don't want to hear anybody's politics when I'm when I'm watching shows. So I just don't watch them. And so, uh, but man, as far as the the quality of watching a broadcast is really good. And so, but for it, the most part, they disappointed me a couple times last year. Like, oh yeah, when, you know, like let me hear. They missed the touchdown against North Carolina, and then oh was, for Notre Dame, yeah, 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 yeah. But but again, that's not it's, if if Notre Dame was their baby that they were giving a hundred million dollars to, you know. I don't know if they would do that, but yes, that's a good point. Be different. Yeah. Well, the, and they missed the they missed the touchdown in the bowl game. Remember, right. they, they missed the snap on the on the touchdown. The, yeah, the fake. Yeah. So you you'll get a little bit of that. Yeah, that's a good point. But I just think the overall quality of the broadcasts are good, in my opinion. I I think that that's one thing they do. Now their announcers are annoying, but I've kind of found that I find most announcers annoying, <laughs> and unless they hire Joel Klatt and Gus Gus Johnson, which is kind of funny that. You know, I find announcer announcers annoying, but I like I love Gus Johnson. I go oh, you like him, yeah. You know, but uh, I I just think he makes games fun to watch. But um, yeah, I uh, I would take that independence means way more to me than what specific TV network that they go with. Yeah. So exactly. if you're going to give me a 15 million more per year, and I get to stay independent, but I my 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 drawback is I have to sign with ESPN. Hey guys, I don't, I mean, I don't care much for NBC either. So I don't, I don't like ESPN, but yeah, do you, it's, do you it's hear not me like hype how much It's I, not like, as we've talked about earlier in the show, it's not like the quality of NBC right. has been so great that it's like, there's you know, no loyalty there for me yeah. anymore. So yeah, that's an, that's an easy one, Sean. What would your answer be to that? I mean, I, absolutely. I, I completely agree with every, you know, with, with what you just said. I, I would, if it means staying independent, I would actually, absolutely keep that deal i would not care which network it happened to be with yeah yeah that would i mean that would that's not even i mean yeah that's quite the faustian bargain i would take that in a heartbeat sean in a heartbeat thanks for the super chat brandon but but before i read this super chat though by the way i need to leave here in a second because i've got a show in a little bit more than now i still have to post the show so i don't know what you okay. want me to do but yeah we're, we're getting close sean, we've got a show Got about four more questions here. We won't add any new ones to it, so we'll be out of here. Okay. All right. No time. Brandon wants to know what's the deal with the Menke and his recruitment. You think it's likely Notre Dame gets beat out by Duke here, like other sites are reporting? <laughs> I don't know what other sites are reporting. I'll just leave you with this, Brandon, because you know I'm 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 someone who doesn't like to steal a kid's moment. I could very much see Paul Menke picking Duke. In that reality, Duke will not have beaten out Notre Dame. And I'll just leave it at that. And we can move on. And right. you know my number. You can shoot me a text. I can maybe explain it later. But, um, yeah, if he picks Duke, which could very well happen, it will have nothing to do with Duke beating out Notre Dame. And someday, when the time is right, I'll be able to share what I'm referring to. But you guys know where I'm, I'm coming from on that one. So, yep, sure. Yeah. Here we go. Irish Oki, what about Joe Davis as a future Notre Dame announcer or IB guest? He grew up in Michigan, big Notre Dame fan, new voice of the Dodgers, following Vince Scully, National Fox MLB lead, Fox College football play by play. I didn't know he was a Notre Dame fan, but interesting. Neither did I. I don't know that I know who Joe Davis is. I don't listen to, I don't watch major, I don't watch baseball anymore. So, and I don't remember. I mean, I may have, if I saw him, let me see his face. I may have seen him doing a, a college football game. But I don't remember. Um, yeah, I don't remember much of his college football. Yeah. I mean, he does he does some NFL on Fox. Um, yeah. I think he had he might have had one of the playoff games for Fox last year, if I remember yeah. right. You know, he's one of the yeah. He might be the number two guy in the Fox booth. But okay, he looks familiar. I just don't can't put a, a voice yeah, to I, it. I've definitely so. heard him do um, some foot or some baseball. You know, yeah. and, and like I said, I know I've heard him do, you know, I, I wouldn't know how to describe him to you other than that. But I mean, he's only going to be a Notre Dame announcer if if uh, Notre Dame ends up on Fox, you know, <laughs> and yeah. I'd be he, guessed. I if mean, he does, if he does a good job, sure. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we, we can reach out. But right now, there's just not a lot of. Uh, yeah, I don't know if there's a lot of 
uh, connections there at this point in time. But yeah, I'll look say, into them. Tracking down them. network guys is not easy. So yeah. All right. Uh, here, here's an interesting question. Promise it's not a Justin Scott question. Is the handle? He asks if you can only get one of this weekend's official visit commits. Which one is your most important to land? Hmm. It would be this weekend. It would. It would be Elijah Rushing. It'd be Elijah Rushing for me. That would. Uh, let me. Let me just quickly look at um, the visit list. I'm. I'm pretty sure because I mean I love Carter Nelson, but. Um, yeah, I don't think I would pick him over Elijah Rushing. So this week's visitors, Cardinal Nelson, Elijah Rushing. Yeah, it'd be Elijah Rushing. Yeah, yeah that's would a agree pretty with easy that. one for me. Yep. That's a pretty easy one for me. Here's one. You can actually answer this one, Sean, because I know you know the answer to it. Jason, does Notre Dame only hire men of the cloth for president of Notre Dame? Yes. E easy answer. Easy answer. Super chat from Mark one Mayock calling games. I would have no problem if Mike Mayock came back and was calling games. I wouldn't either. None. I don't think None. a lot of people would. I enjoyed him immensely. Immensely. Here we go from Scott L. Scott, what are the cutoffs for Notre Dame football? One, getting an excellent deal for broadcast of its home games. Two, getting a good deal. Three, mediocre. Four, disappointing. Or five, bad deal. I mean, I think the cutoff needs to be two. I mean, I, I I don't think a mediocre deal right now is something that I'd be willing to accept, to be completely honest with you. But but what would a me mediocre deal be? Right. You know, to me, less than – I mean, because you could say, okay, well, what if you only got 45, which is, you know, 10 to 15 below what people have said in the past is like the minimum. Well, okay, that wouldn't be great, but you're still getting 10 million from the ACC, so you're still doubling up your TV revenue. Plus, you're going to get a much bigger apparel deal. So, I mean, I guess that'd be a mediocre deal. So I, I could somewhat live if it's the high end of the mediocre deal. I could probably live with it. But, I mean, you are you're you need to be one or two. Absolutely. I mean, your your independence is riding on it. Right. Exactly. That's a great point. It's, it's a know, great point. I mean, there's you, really can't no, go, you can't go to mediocre. You're, really, really yeah. not a lot to say besides that. Your independence is riding on it. I mean, that's a great that's a great way of putting it, Sean. I mean, and, and it's spot on. I mean, if you get a mediocre deal, it's going to be a lot harder for you to main, remain independent for the next 10 years. Right. It's going to be really hard. Yep. Yeah. That's a, that's a great, uh, that's a, that's a great point. Yeah. I don't even, man. Uh, Ian Johnson just says, I don't care who announces, uh, uh, announcers are as long as they're knowledgeable about what they're talking about. I, I agree, but That's fair. I, I also think there needs to be some level of uh, audio quality to a person. Like if you get some guy that has this really annoying voice, but he's really smart, I'm still not going to really want to listen to him for three hours. I'm just, just not, you yeah. know what I mean? Like, there's a, you know, I don't watch like a ton of, of NBA basketball, but I watch some and there's a certain guy who does um, both NBA as well as some college games as well for CBS. And I'm not talking about Kevin Harlan, <laughs> but this other guy, if he's doing a game, I just can't listen. I just cannot yeah. stand his voice. Yeah, so. it's it's interesting. I mean, and, and there's been some people like that over the years that I that I've just like, God, I can't listen to this guy. Yeah, but like Jim Nance is you know knowledgeable. He does, but he's just got a great voice and presentation as well. Right. It's it's you know and and the good ones are guys that can like I think one thing about Mike Tirico that I liked is he would make the guy next to him better mm -hmm. with the way that he would lead them into things and and get it back on track. And and there's a there's a talent to that as well. I mean, so it, it's you can be knowledgeable but not do a good show and not put on a good product. And so I think. Knowledge is important. It can be a deal breaker for me, but if it's two knowledgeable people, I'm going to hire the guy that is more audio pleasing to listeners and someone who's really good at, at leading the broadcast smoothly through a game. And that's something where, you know, when, when you, when you think of who are the great ones, like the reason that I thought John Madden and um, I'm drawing a blank on Summerall, Pat Summerall, Pat Summerall were so good is because, Pat Summerall knew how to get John Madden back on track. Right. But also knew how to get John Madden to be John Madden. And he let John Madden be John Madden, but then he could get it back to the other thing. And he had that voice. And Pat Summerall know? could say less because 
and, yes. and be much more low key because John Madden was going to say more and was going to have a lot more exuberance to go right. With. So I think when you look at those things, and and here's the thing: Pat Summerall was a former, I believe, former NFL football player. Correct? Right. Played for the. So Giants. it's not yeah. like he didn't know football, but he knew his role. And he knew how to and, – and if if that guy's not good, it's going to be harder for the color guy to be good. Right. Like, I think the play-by-play guy, a good play-by-play guy is the ultimate key to a good broadcast, in my opinion, because you can have a really knowledgeable color guy. But let's say I'm doing color. Sean, what would be the one problem that the play-by-play guy would have to always be on his P's and Q's about if I'm doing color with him? You can say it. <laughs> you can say it. Like not talking as much. I yes, mean. <laughs> exactly. Hey, man, we're on to the next what play. We were talking about. Yeah, right. that's right. So a good what... play-by-play guy would have to say, hey, man, like, okay. Uh, but then also not do it in a way that it's he he's shutting you down, right? I mean, right. so those things are important. Uh, you know, so you've got to know what are the strengths and weaknesses of your sidekick and then and, and lead it down a good path. So I think that's a very underrated part of being a play-by-play guy. That the great ones do. Jim Nance is great about that. He was great about kind of reining Billy Packer in when Billy Packer was kind of getting fired up, like, okay, we're going here. Right. And uh and that's what I think makes the 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 to me that defines a broadcast. And maybe that's different for me because I know football. I don't need the color guy to explain it to me. Right. Even though I I enjoy listening to Tony Dungeon guys that are good at it. But I need a good play-by-play guy that can really tell a story despite the fact I'm seeing it. And that's a gift and then make it entertaining. And that's why I like Gus Johnson is, I mean, he's good at those things, but he's entertaining. I enjoy, he can make a four yard run sound exciting. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? And yeah. you know, there's other people that can make a, like, I remember it was uh, the Clemson game last year. And there was something big happen and just listening to uh, um, Collinsworth and, and Garrett. It's like, God, you guys made that sound really boring. <laughs> and it was a really big play, you know uh-huh. what I mean? And it's just like, gosh, uh-huh. dog, you know, Gus Johnson's over here making a, a hitch route completion for a to convert a second and four, sound like you just won a Super Bowl, and you, <laughs> you guys aren't able to, you know, make this play exciting. And I think that's a big part of it for me, anyway, absolutely. Sean. So, yep, yeah, absolutely. Anyway, all right, so that's going to do it, Sean, uh, for for this one. I, I enjoyed the show. Why don't you take us out of here? All right, well, you know what to do: hit the like button, and of course, subscribe rate review one hour from now on this very same platform ib nation sports talk comes your way i've got notre dame women's basketball coach neil ivy i asked her uh, about the jack swarbrick announcement today so we'll talk a little bit about that we'll also talk about uh, marcus freeman as uh the women's basketball super fan and a whole lot more uh olivia miles an update on her and her injury and and all the new additions to the roster and everything else. So that's coming up an hour from now. And then Jesse's going to be with me for rapid fire as well. Brian, enjoy you guys talk it. about that freshman class, Sean, you guys going to talk, do you we guys did. talk about that at all? Nice. Talked about the incoming freshman Hannah the transfer Hannah Hannah players. is yep. a beast. Yep. That's right. I can't wait to watch her play. Yep. So, so we've got all that coming up an hour from now, Brian, I will talk to you later. Everyone Thanks, else, Sean. hopefully we'll talk to you in an hour. Hey, head to IB Nation Sports Talk, everybody. Go get some dinner, chill, relax, and then be ready for it. It's going to be a great show. Talk to you all soon. All right.